dialogue about the Temple of Solomon, or about the three degrees of the saints. Written 1680-1689 Leipzig, by Balthasari Kupka. Translated by Sean Dunn. Here you see, dear reader. The cross, the sun, the two moons, do you think fiction and depicts are in this table? You are wrong. In this way, the carnal man, the external, the fanatic world, considers everything spiritual and internal. Behold! The kingdom of God and all knowledge of things. Thus it is hidden in us, like a treasure in the field. You know who you are, who you were, and who you will be. You were born a sinner, I know that, a monster horrific and huge, to whom the light was admitted. Terror, anxiety and pain make your eccentric, in which you are wrapped in wax, you waver with a miserable heart, by obscuring the center you are hidden. The sun rising from a high heaven admits his ardor to warm you, the clouds holding you back will dissipate. Beloved, the world and Satan are your enemies. Standing against them, you will surely flee, unless it stands for you Jesus was crucified. In this sign you will win and drive your enemies to flight. The moon became shining, the shape of the world changed and the mind changed. You have begun, progress not fail. You own borrowed goods, not your own. Use not abuse. For the eye of the Lord sees all things. With small or shining powers. But be careful, lest, having the sediment at the bottom, you become disturbed by it again and lose your clarity. At last the sediment was completely deposited, and the solar plane was born. He became a partaker of the perfect man in Christ. Through the cross you will come to the light. Then you don't need to be taught by anyone. For the anointing will teach you everything, and in the light of the Lord you will see the light. Come, see, win, farewell forever, etc. Dialogue about the Temple of Solomon. Or about the three steps taken, namely beginners, advanced and adults. Through the three courts of the Temple of Solomon, secured, to the sanctuary. In which, besides other things useful in Christianity, of these in offices common and distinct to Christ dangers, obstacles and aids they are expounded from the sacred letters. Author? Balthazaro Kupka. Pastore and Inspector Nancy in March. Brandenburg. Alpha and Omega. Author's Preface to the Beloved Reader. This Dialogue, L. V. I wrote this dialogue 18 years ago, not to be published publicly, but to have it in which to exercise myself, and to explore my journey in sanctification, in the company of some friends, who agreed with me in this study, and deplored the profane and corrupt manners of the present age. Among these with our Lord. Master Tuberus, formerly a most important theologian, now happily deceased, sent him after some years to the most famous theologian, our Lord Master Spenero was still in Dresden, after discussing the matter with the venerable theological faculty of Leipzig, he thought about publishing my dialogue. When I was asked whether I would allow what I had written to myself and a few, to become public law, I answered that if they think that the church can derive any benefit from it, they should allow me. At least I expressed my name in full, as it did not seem advisable to me at the time. Then, God nodding, a little book came out with the preface of our Lord Master Spenery, on Christian perfection, approving convenient. It is possible Theological Leipzig 1689. And, God blessing, it pleased many pious and learned men, so that there was no lack of those who took counsel to translate it into the German language. But some seeing this, being envious of the progress of their brethren, neglecting their own, to whom, as Augustine speaks elsewhere, nothing seems right, except what they themselves have done, suppressed contrary thoughts about him, and according to the custom of this age, now nearly ended, what was displeased by what was written, heresy suspected, and they wanted to make him infamous. Among these Daniel Hartnickius first began to pluck my dialogue, in his librarian, a book which he published for the use of studious youth, to whom he recommended a catalogue of the best books in every capacity, praising some authors, and marking others with a dark slate at will, and among these chapters of the doctrine of Christ, extracts from the homilies of Master Spinet on the necessity and possibility of true Christianity. 
and my dialogue at the same time tried to disguise Socinianism, and Arminianism. When our Lord Master Spenerus succeeded Master Joshua Schwartz, who, in a homily held and published on the inauguration of a certain cemetery, in New Rainsburg, had openly condemned my dialogue with all those who approved of it, later, in a special appendix, thesis, the measure of sanctifying grace under the New Testament is more abundant than it is under the Old, he took it upon himself to attack and destroy teaching. I gave the same degree of sanctity I gave to the faithful of both testaments in the sacred letters, and in the dialogue picking up various points, as if similar to those asserted by the Valentinians, Montanists, Novatians, and other heretics, first of all the study of sanctification more diligently than the common people like, accusing the Pharisees of hypocrisy, and so the whole dialogue, together with the Spenerian claims. Hartnikio wanted to overthrow the opposition. A little after, while I was in the process of publishing the apology against him, translated into the vernacular, Master Maris approached, writing why theology could not agree with Master Spinet, etc. again rejecting my dialogue, as a heretical pamphlet, recommended by Spinet, repeating the same accusations with Master Schwartz, and some other things about diligence in the study of holiness, about the danger of apostasy, etc. As papist, interimist and horrendous condemning, to whom as much as is sufficient, I replied. Finally after writing to each other Master Spinet and Master Albert on the steps of renewal, how long shall it last in this life, etc. I also saw Master Carpsovius openly condemning this entire doctrine of perfection, and the more diligent pursuit of sanctification, those who aspire to higher degrees, accusing all of them with promiscuous pharisaic pride, and teaching that the reborn should live here until death in perpetual prison, and that the spiritual struggle was always difficult for them throughout their whole lives, etc. In the Funeral Sermon from Romans. 7. 22, 23, 24. Over the death of the Beloved, our Lord. Master Wagner's drink and printed excuse. Hence it came to pass that when the copies of my dialogue were wanting, and all hope of a second edition at Leipzig was taken away from me, lest the matter should be reduced to such an extent, that it should be immediately rejected by the common people as erroneous, which is commended to the pious, I had to find an editor elsewhere. Wherefore when certain supporters of the pursuit of holiness and friends of Christians, rejoicing in promoting the kingdom of God, and in it the profit of the faithful, to such a thinker, they kindly offered their work for the repeated edition of this Amsterdam edition, I willingly followed the direction of God, and I approved their plan, which I have already wished to mention in a few words. Live, L. B. in this edition, and judge more equitably. Goodbye. 2. Corinthians? 6. 15, 17, 18. And chapter 7. 1. You are the temple of the living God, God said to the fig tree. Leviticus. 26. 12. I will dwell and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore come out from the midst of them, and separate yourselves, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, Isaiah. 52. 2. And I will be your father, and you will be my sons and sons, says the Almighty Lord. 2. Samuel. 7. 14. Therefore, since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. In nomine Jesu. Prologue on Solomon's Temple. Matthew and Paul. Matthew. We read in the Old Testament that God took care to build the tabernacle of Moses first, then the Temple of Solomon, among the people of Israel. Why is this? Paul? These allegorically depict two covenants, the old preceding the new, and the new succeeding the old. Matthew. Show me that briefly, please. Paul? The tabernacle was built in the temple. The temple was built in its likeness, drawn in the tabernacle, so the Old Testament in the New Testament complete, and the New Testament is drawn up and founded on the Old Testament. Then, the tabernacle was mobile and portable. A fixed and stable temple, thus the Old Testament was changeable and abrogated, but the New Testament is unchangeable and eternal. Finally, the tabernacle was made of curtains and linens, which could be folded and unfolded, and it just stood there, just not being seen. But the temple, built of stones prepared with the utmost care, always stood, 
and was always seen. Thus in the Old Testament God was worshipped under the envelope of external rites. For the Jews were taught what these external things meant to them, how they looked to the future Messiah, and thus they were constantly led by the externals to the internals, through the corporeal to the spiritual, through the visible to the invisible, it was explained. In the New Testament, however, God wants to be worshipped in spirit and truth, where the pious do not. Therefore, the New Testament should be read in the first place, where we find the spiritual things, hidden under the shadows of the Old Testament, brilliantly explained, clearly handed down, and illustrated with the sweetest similitudes, and adapted to our understanding. We live under New Testament. Matthew. Therefore Old Testament will it be completely abolished and not read. Paul. I do not want this, but that it should be read in such a way that through the letter of the Old Testament we may ascend to the spirit of the New Testament through history to allegory, tropology or anagogy. Thus Christ the Apostle and the fathers of the early church, especially Saint Augustine in our, in Psalms they read and handed us the Old Testament to be read. Matthew 12. 40, 41, 42. Galatians. 4. 21. What is the use of reading historian Old Testament if we do not apply to ourselves? The devil knows it better than any mortal. But of what use is this information to him? They are therefore to be sought in the reading of Old Testament which the devil cannot find and finish, and from the inspection of the tabernacle we must learn how the temple was built, and still to be built, and adorned. To demand greater holiness from God under the New Testament. Matthew. What then is the temple of God? Paul? The New Testament church is either universal or particular, which is otherwise called, domiciled in the universal temple Ephesians. 2. 22. Or a heart faithful to the Holy Spirit enlightened and sanctified by the word of God, of which we have already spoken. For just as God was once worshipped in the temple, so even now God must be served with such an enlightened and sanctified heart. Outside the temple all worship was empty. Thus, whatever is not done from the heart, and indeed enlightened and sanctified, by the light of faith and the holiness of the new godliness, that is not accepted by God. Matthew. But we read that the temple was grander, more splendid, and more perfect than the tabernacle, what is this? Paul? Of course, under the New Testament, God requires greater piety and holiness than under the Old Testament. Matthew. Where will you prove this? Paul? Paul the Apostle teaches this here and there in his epistles, Romans. 1. 17. The justice of God is revealed in the Gospel, which Christ fulfilled. But Christ's holiness in life and patience in death was greater than the holiness and patience of all the patriarchs, prophets and saints. For Christ, by his doctrine and life, explained and fulfilled the law, and in the law, the justice of God, which no one can properly understand unless he looks at the most perfect model of Scripture. No one can fulfill it unless he has seen the most rigid justice of God, takes refuge in the most faithful obedience of Christ, and through faith in Christ obtains the remission of sins and the Holy Spirit for a new obedience. Hence St. Paul famously says, Romans. 3. 25, 26. That Christ was proposed to us as a propitiatory when we approach God through prayers, looking to the Ark of the Covenant and the Golden Propitiatory over it, for all those who prayed were to look towards this and from here promise themselves that they would be heard. Thus in the New Testament we must always look back to Christ and believe and hope that God will be merciful to us because of him, through faith in his blood Romans. 13. 11. Etc. Hebrews. 1. 2. Christ teaches, requiring more abundant justice, Matthew. 5. 20. But if you want to be shown to yourself, consider with me Galatians. 4. 1. Now I say that since a child is a hare, it does not differ from a servant, etc. 5. 3. Thus we, when we were children, etc. 5. 6. Since you are indeed sons, God sent the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba Father. 5. 7. That he should no longer be a servant, but a son. Etc. Note here, 1, 
in Old Testament to sow in fontes. In the New Testament they are grown children. But we require more from adults than from children. 2. In the Old Testament God sent the prophets, his servants, to bring the servile or pedagogical spirit, whence the pious are called the servants of God. In the New Testament he sent his Son, who brought the filial spirit. Romans, 8, 15. Whence the pious are called sons. But we require more of children than of servants, or children under the pedagogue. Thus God requires greater confidence in the New Testament. The servants say, Lord, and dare not come nearer. The children cry out, Abba, my father, and approach more confidently. God requires greater obedience. Servants obey the Spirit, compelled in a certain way, by the hope of reward and fear of punishment, acting, if it were not for this, I would not obey. But the children obey with a freer and spontaneous spirit born of love for their parents, saying, even if there were nothing to hope for or fear, I would still obey, because nothing is more decent, nothing more delightful, than for children to love their parents and to obey them. Servants and children, then, in obeying, are most attracted by the sugar of utility, but adolescents by the ingenuous decorum of honesty, which obedience is both more generous and more pleasing. Worthy of the Lord, Colossians. 1. 10. Philippians. 1. 27. 1 Thessalonians. 2. 12. John. 15. 14. You are my friends if you do what I command you. 5. 15. I no longer call you servants, because the servant does not know what his master is doing. Etc. Note, in the Old Testament the pious were called servants, in the New Testament friends. We speak more familiarly with friends than with servants, therefore we expect from them greater love, faith, and care, for we open the innermost parts of our hearts to them, and we entrust them with the greatest affairs. Thus Christ requires from us greater love, faith, integrity, prudence, and diligence. In sum, to whom more is committed, from him more is required. Pious New Testament more committed. Therefore you need our Saviour more. Greater grace is given to revelation, therefore greater recognition of God is required. The greatest mysteries have been entrusted to us, therefore the greatest effort is required to learn them properly. The Saviour alludes to this by saying, John the Baptist was the greatest among the prophets, Old Testament. Matthew. 11. 2. But the least minister in the Kingdom of God New Testament, would be the greater John Baptista, he managed to do it, as regards the knowledge of the mysteries. The greater grace of sanctification was given, to Peter. 1. 3.10. Therefore greater diligence is required in the study of holiness. Hebrews. 7. 19. For the law made nothing perfect, but the introduction of a better hope, by which the mouse approaches God. Under New Testament we have a better hope, as if to say, that to which the pious looked Old Testament for what was promised to them, that has been presented to us. Therefore greater prudence, wisdom, vigilance, abstinence, patience, and constancy are required of us. A nobler gem should be guarded more carefully. And who, for the sake of the more precious Margaret, would refuse to undertake greater labors, to undergo greater dangers. Under the New Testament we come nearer to the fire of divine love, while the pious in the New Testament stood more distant. Therefore, let us be more heated with the love of God and endure greater things for God's sake. Consider Paul, who was more persevering than Job. He has been afflicted for at least seven years, the twenty-seven-year-old. Paul's patience was greater than David's. For this time he lamented thirteen times in the Psalter, Lord, how long? He asked the Lord at least three times to take away the sting, he obeyed the warning and took it bravely. Briefly, God's grace appeared greater in the New Testament, therefore greater gratitude is required of us. Do you still doubt that greater piety and holiness are required under the New Testament? Matthew. It seems to follow from this that the pious Old Testament were not holy, did they not approach God? Paul? It does not follow that, but at least this, that they were not so holy, they did not come so close to God, as the pious New Testament can. I am not talking about the lights of the Ot Patriarchs and the extraordinary holy prophets, 
but about ordinary pious people, in whom he took many things, such as hardness of heart, which God no longer bears in the Old Testament. Think of this, our God is a consuming fire. No sinner can approach him unless he is cleansed of his sins. Pious Old Testament to approach God, but standing further off, because of many ignorances and infirmities, Acts 17. 30. Romans. 3. 25, 26. Which God took away before the atonement of Christ, he does not want to bear after it. The pious in the New Testament can draw nearer to God, more cleansed of their sins, because God has reserved something better for them. Hebrews. 11. 40. God is most holy. The nearer one approaches him, the healthier he must be. Matthew. I wonder if these things are so, where will you find a pious New Testament? We hardly see the piety of the New Testament. But how do you prove that the pious New Testament can approach God for the pious? Paul. Consider with me the passages of Hebrews, 9, 7, 8, 10, 19, 12, 18, 29. After considering these, it will be clear that the priests of the Old Testament could not enter the Holy of Holies, except the pontiff alone, but under the New Testament. All can do so, that is to draw nearer to God, and to be led further in sanctification. For Christ, the just and holy, only receives the just and holy into his company and joins them closer to himself. Let them therefore continue in sanctification with the fear of the Lord, too. Corinthians? 7. 1. Those who want to enter the sanctuary. The possibility of continuing in holiness. Matthew. I do not yet understand how to continue in holiness, how we can enter the sanctuary. Is there no other sanctity in us than that which is imputed through the faith of Christ? Paul? You are mistaken, besides this the sanctity of the new life begun in us is required, and this, I say, must be continued and completed or perfected. This is indicated by the term perfected by the Holy Spirit, which is most commonly used by the apostles, when they emphasize the continuation of holiness. Matthew. I allow this to be done, but the flesh, lusting against the Spirit, stands in the way and hinders the continuation. Paul. To crucify and mortify the flesh of concupiscence, to abolish the body of sin, all obstacles are to be broken through, and thus to proceed in the way of holiness. Matthew. How is that possible? Paul. Through the Spirit of Saint Anne, is God greater in our heart? Is not the Spirit, which lusts and struggles against the flesh, able to overcome the same? Matthew. Indeed, faith is our victory, by which we overcome the world, while the victory of Christ is imputed to us. Paul. It is supposed to be so. But will he be a partaker of the victory of Christ, who does not follow the victor in the way of holiness? He overcame that you might overcome. What is the use of fighting if you do not want to win? Putatively you fight, putatively you win. I will never believe that the devil and the world will let you go, unless you are truly overcome by the virtue of Christ, true faith does not consist only in the imputation of Christ's death. To atone for past sins, but also in the communion of Christ's death, to cleanse the present and future, for faith commands us to die with Christ to sins and rise again to righteousness, to shake off the yoke of the slavery of sin, and to serve righteousness, the fruit of whose service is holiness. Romans. 6. 22. But to be freed from the dominion of sin, which must not be imputed but truly mourned in our hearts, is to conquer the world and the flesh. And this victory is followed by the servitude of justice, according to Paul, and sanctification. We are justified by faith, we are sanctified by good works, or the fruits of effective faith. Now it is necessary to join together these principal articles on dulification and sanctification, as Paul does in all the epistles, if we wish to add a third one on glorification. To proceed through the steps. Matthew. I do not deny that. But I seek at least this, how among so many impediments of the flesh, in such human weakness, can we continue in holiness, so much so that we enter the sanctuary itself, as you said above. Paul. Slowly, and gradually. For no one could ascend to the temple except by steps. The temple had three courts, as it was known, through which the priests entered the sanctuary. 
Thus there are three most important degrees of saints, namely, beginners, advanced, and adults, through which the soul ascends to be sanctified, before it is admitted into the sanctuary, and is exhilarated by the taste of eternal happiness, and other signs of intimate friendship from the best Saviour. These, if you please, I will briefly review, for the powers granted by God. In the meantime, it is better to experience the happiness of the saints in the heart than to describe it in long words. Matthew. I would like to hear that, but first describe those who are outside the temple, so that I can distinguish them from those who are inside. It is already difficult and laborious to distinguish the saints from the profane, when the last night of the world has come, and in the darkness we easily see lilies for wheat. Paul. It will be done, strengthened by the Spirit of the Lord. Amen. End of Prologue. Part 1. Those who are outside the temple. Chapter 1. Of those who are far away. Paul. Many hearers, ungodly and unbelieving, think that they are outside the church and the company of Christ, that Turks and Jews, or others, are needed, who do not use our public confession and rites, including all the rest who receive public worship, and that none of them, however he lives, is to be condemned consider. Matthew. I have experienced this in common life, when funerals take place, it is wrongly led to want to condemn anyone, even if he has lived in the most ignominious way. Paul. And therefore I think that a distinction must be made between those who are at a distance, and they are near outside the temple. They used to call those heretics, these bad people Catholics, and they excluded both from the strength of Christ. For who would believe that profane and impure souls, who do not want to be cleansed, are received into the shrine of Christ? When the Jews had formerly profaned the temple by admitting the wicked, he preferred to leave the temple and deliver it to ruin, rather than to admit the impure. How I fear that the same thing may happen to us, or that it has already happened in part? Matthew. But why do you distinguish in this way? As experience testifies, those who seem to be more mobile become closer to God than those who seem to be close. Consider Fudeus and Hentes. The neighbor of the church always wants to be the last. Paul. Timely warnings. And therefore, because of popular opinion, I make a distinction in this way, not that some are different from others, but that they are generally considered to be more distant from the temple of God. Matthew. Perhaps you are alluding to the Queen of the East, who, moved by the fame of the temple and King Solomon, came to Jerusalem from the ends of the earth, and saw the temple with great avidity and amazement, which, however, had already been despised by the citizens or the daily life. Paul? It is so. She was at a distance outside the temple. The kings of the Moabites, Ammonites and Edomites were also far away outside the temple. Matthew. But she came? Some of these are not read as having come. Paul? Well, so there is a difference between those who are remotely outside. The evangelical truth has spread throughout the world. Some hear and despise, preferring their idolatrous temples and blaspheming those who go to the temple of God, as the Samaritans and other nations of old did. Some hear and neglect, they do not prevent those who set out, but still they do not join them, but continue in the ways of their fathers, of their own people, even though they do not know that there are better ways of coming to God. Some hear the report, and come, daunted neither by the expense, nor by the difficulties and dangers of the way. Matthew. Do you think that it is entirely agreeable to all to come in this way? Many do not know what is going on. Many people look at the disadvantages of travel. Will they not have an excuse, because they did not seek the temple of God, and did not find it? Paul? None. They will be at the end of the defense, because God brought the report of the temple to their ears, which, if they had been eager for salvation, they should have searched further, searched for the temple, sought to find it. Those who do this arrive at the recognition of the truth, and from being distant they become relatives. Chapter 2. Of those, who are relatives, and nevertheless outside. Solomon's foreign women. Matthew. We read that in favor of the exotic women, whom Solomon had married, a certain enchantment was built outside the city, why is this? Couldn't he use the temple? Paul? That is what I said. The Queen of the East came from the most remote mouth and sought and loved the temple. 
These spouses of Solomon lived every day in the city, they could see the temple every day, and they did not go in, but were disgusted. For these, neglecting the temple of God, took care to build other temples for themselves, thus, many, in accordance with the vanity of their minds, build for themselves another temple, another gospel, another Christ, who is in harmony with the world, nay, they reject the foolish and absurd. Nothing seems more foolish and absurd to these men, than to flake off all worldly things, after the example of Christ, and patiently bear insults and disgrace. And these themselves are often considered neighbors, although they are far removed from the temple of God, because they themselves do not enter, and they prevent others from entering. By these the way of truth is blasphemed. Moreover, do you not hear how much they boast of loving Christ, just as those exotic women love Solomon? But love is more harlot, not greedy, seeking its own, not the things of Christ, that is, its profit, advantage and honor, not of Christ, who for this reason will once say, I do not know you. Proseries and citizens contemptuous. Matthew. But do you think that among the nobles of the hall and the citizens there were some who lived near the temple and seldom or disdainfully entered it? Paul? There is no doubt of this, since the Holy Spirit often complains in the Holy Scriptures about the contempt and neglect of the temple. Scarcely had it been built, when it was neglected, and for that reason it was robbed of its treasures and ornaments, that is to say, the golden shields to which the bronzes succeeded. 2. Pa. 12. 9. And we read the quotations, that it afterwards collapsed, was restored, and collapsed again, until God completely withdrew his gracious presence, which abundantly testifies to the negligence of the citizens. This was done in the first times, what did not happen in the last, when the ways to the house of God were completely deserted and unknown, and very few who found them and walked them. He experiences the same fate under the New Testament. The study of true piety, which was golden in the first years, lastly yellow, indeed, there is none. Daniel 2. 43. The Christians of the past were more holy. Matthew. Do you think then that the Christians in the church were holier in the past than they are now? Paul? The writings of the apostles and fathers of the church teach this. Matthew. Do you think that the Christians lived in such a way as the apostles and fathers wrote? We already see many useful books on piety. But who believes that the authors live so as they write? Paul? Of these there is nothing to judge. But of those apostles and the first Christians is it plainly foolish to think so. If they had not lived as they wrote, how would the evangelical truth have stood before them, how would the Christians have believed the apostles commanding those things which no one can prevent? How could they imitate Christ, who taught nothing but what he himself did? The apostles delivered nothing but what was necessary, and useful for salvation. It indicates that they are short in writing. For they wrote not huge volumes, but short epistles, in which, rejecting the futile and useless, they at least briefly pointed out the necessary and useful things, so that the more happily and easily the Christian converts could retain and observe them, to whom they knew that the Holy Spirit had been communicated, who taught these briefly written within the heart to understand correctly and to express life. Nor did they need lengthy explanations of terms, who experienced the very thing in their hearts and showed others by their example. How the words of the apostles were to be understood, the Christians explained this by examples and by their own lives. The apostles at least, delivered the necessary and useful things. Therefore, unless they had observed all the precepts of the apostles, i.e. all their teaching, how could they be saved? It has been enough for our times to be sad. Having obtained this most pernicious error, that not everything that is handed down in the sacred and most important parts of the New Testament, being observed, is necessary, nor is it possible because of human weakness. Is it not the greatest impudence to impute the same error to the lambs of the church in the first days? As if they, as far as we are concerned, have neglected the temple of God, and have been yawning in sanctification. Neglected and different citizens. Matthew. But what do you feel about the citizens neglecting the temple? Paul? They seem not to do it in one way. One, some admire and praise the temple, but pass on to their domestic affairs. Thus there are those who praise the study of piety in others, but do not begin it themselves. 2. Some stand idle, looking outwards at the temple, and tell others of its beauty, 
which they themselves have not seen, but have received from those who have seen it. Thus there are those who insist on the doctrine of true piety, but it is derived from the books and learned writings of others, and not taught by their own experience and by the sacred letters of the Holy Spirit. We agreed, losing the words of others. Saying, not doing. 3. Some stand immediately before the doors of the temple, but do not enter the temple. Acts. 3. 2. Matthew. Perhaps you think of the lame man who, lying before the gate of the temple, which was called beautiful, asked for help from those who entered, and was healed by Peter, and the apostles who were going up to the temple. Paul. You cast correctly. That beggar was lame, not in his mouth, but in his feet. Thus many have their mouths chattering about piety, but their feet are closed. The way they show others, they do not walk themselves. That beggar did not ask for health but for alms. Thus many seek in the sacred letters, not the health of a depraved mind, but the amusement of the imagination in the variety of phrases and words, and the varying opinions of the interpreters upon them. Many ask God not for spiritual things, but for earthly things, not for eternal salvation, but for temporal comforts. For such is the heart, such is the treasure which you seek from God in the Holy Scriptures. The carnal heart seeks carnal things, the spiritual spiritual things. This everywhere means a life promised, temporal happiness, that is to say, to be passed in this world without toils, troubles, adversities, among the applause and feasts of friends, and afterwards eternal happiness, this is raised from the corporeal to the spiritual, from the temporal to the eternal, and awaits eternal happiness in patience among enemies, persecutions, and temptations. Whenever the scripture mentions joy, it is imagined to be carnal, this is understood by the spiritual. As the heart tastes and smells, such things it seeks in the sacred, understands and asks from God. Matthew. And those who thus seek and ask for carnal things, do you also place them outside the temple? Paul? Why? They do not know and neglect spiritual matters. And what is most important, they seek carnal gold in that place, where only spiritual things are to be sought. The words of the scriptures are healing words, he who does not use them to heal a corrupted mind, but to feed the useless curiosity of the knowledge of superfluous things, he is abused, and by this abuse he is so corrupted that he can scarcely be healed unless the special grace of God comes. You see this lame man leaning close to the temple. But unless by a miracle he had been made woolen by Peter, he would never have entered the temple. Thus, those who seem to be the closest to the temple of God, do not enter the least of all, and those who seem to be the most remote and last, are the first to enter. Matthew. It is not surprising therefore, that the Saviour himself commended the Queen of the South as an example of diligence in seeking the truth, that is, according to piety. Thus many will live from east and west, from north and south, I, e from the remotest parts of the world, and those who joined the kingdom of God with Abraham and other Puspo down, excluding the sons of the kingdom, who thought that the kingdom belonged to them alone, and seemed to be neighbours to the kingdom. Paul? Well and this, indeed, because, what these despise, others magnify, what these people loathe, they long for. God fills the hungry with his goods, the rich let the empty go. Let us see, therefore, that we do not remain outside the temple with the unbelieving and profane, the contemptible and the negligent, but that we enter it with the holy and pious. For outside are dogs, profane, and those who love and practice falsehood, inside, however, are saints, whom the Most Holy Saviour receives into his company, and sanctifies ever further. For he is the one who sanctifies, the pious are sanctified. Hebrews 2. 2. Chapter 3. What happens when you enter the temple? Few of these. Matthew. When many remain outside the temple, not only among those who hear the word, but also among those who hear the word itself, it is left to the very few to enter the temple and reach true holiness of heart. Paul? It is so. Few are truly pious. Matthew. But aren't there those who insult God and the neighbor, and the Pharisaics who are turgid with excess of bid, who restrict true piety to a few? Paul? But I would not have believed that, when they mourn this small number, they desire for all a taste of the divine goodness, that they may know that they are drawn, so that they may desire to draw all others to God, 
and teach that which the truth itself gives, deploring the greatest wickedness of men, namely, that many are called, but few are chosen, because the majority of those called, do not come to the sanctuary of God. I prefer therefore to enter the temple with a few, than to pass it by with a multitude of despisers, or at least, to look at it in passing. Return to self-knowledge. Matthew. What is it to enter the temple? Paul. Our heart is a temple. He enters the temple who enters his heart, he who averts his eyes from others, turns to himself, who ceases to judge others, and begins to examine and judge himself. For many know many things, but do not know themselves. Matthew. Perhaps you insinuate that trite, do you know yourself? Paul? The holy apostles hint at the same thing, let each one watch over himself, try his own work. Of God. Matthew. But this is the most difficult. For most people spend the whole force of their soul in their external senses, in the eyes of others, in their own cages, they notice the mistakes of others more easily than their own. But this is how they used to be on Fridays. It is difficult to correct a habit, and to gather a mind thus scattered to itself. Paul? I admit that the mind of many dwells outside of itself, not within itself, and that it is difficult to change its habitation, but unless one changes and returns to himself, he will never reach God. For we do not come to a living and true knowledge of God except through our own knowledge. To know oneself is among those whose beginning is heavy, whose middle is light, and whose end is delightful. Matthew. This is what the ethnics are willing to do, who, however, have not entered the temple of true piety. Paul? Good advice. Therefore it is not simply impossible. No, therefore, that he who enters the temple first returns to himself, then goes on to God, and gradually raises his mind from the human to the divine, from the corporeal to the spiritual, from the visible to the invisible, from the earthly to the eternal, from the temporal to the eternal. To have above, to stir in the mind those things which are above, to complain of those things which are above, not to look at the visible but the invisible. Those things which are found in the temple of God are above the mind, above reason, and above all comprehension. Chapter 4. How do we get in? Through pious meditations on the divine word. Matthew. What was previously difficult, you are now asking for the impossible. In what way, then, can we enter the temple of God? Paul? Not by the forces of nature, but by the grace of God preventing, preparing, leading and leading. We enter by the light of the word, guided by the Holy Spirit. We enter through the pious meditations of the divine word, in which the Holy Spirit elevates our mind from the carnal to the spiritual, from the temporal to the eternal. In any case, just as a fish rarely raises its head above the water, but remains in the water as if in its own element, and remains most willingly in the water. Thus the human mind cannot raise or extend its thoughts to those things which are outside the sphere of this visible world, of this age. As fish swim about in the water, thus the thoughts of the human mind revolve around the things of this world. As fish seek nourishment in the sea, thus the thoughts of mankind are the amusement of the world. If you see fish out of the water, either they are larger, which sometimes jump up and soon re-emerge, or they are dead, which can no longer swim and are of no use. Thus thoughts which are merely human, sometimes extended to the divine and eternal, are either immediately relegated or absorbed. For who can comprehend eternity in his mind? Matthew. We see, however, that fishes are taken alive from the waters and are used by men. Paul. Thus the Holy Spirit draws out our thoughts from the world with the hook of the word, and then they are usefully engaged in the divine. For all divine things are above human grasp, the human mind cannot rise to it without the light of the Holy Spirit, and the support of the divine word. Such as the meditations of Gentile wise men. Matthew. What do you say? Can it be, that the wise men left their meditations on the divine and eternal? Whence is it evident that they were able to extend their thoughts even to the divine and eternal, although they did not have the light of the Holy Spirit and the divine word? Paul? They had the light of nature, but not all, at least the wise. By the light of nature I mean certain remnants of the divine image which have collapsed in the mind. Once upon a time there was full light and perfect rectitude in our hearts created in the image of God, alas, 
we have already succeeded through the fall. Darkness and horrible distortions. But among them there are still hidden some sparks in the intellect for the discrimination of the honorable and the profane, for arguing from the goodness and wisdom of creatures to the goodness and wisdom of the Creator. There are still some hidden impulses in the will to be honest and upright. When sometimes arise in the mind self-accusing and excusing thoughts, the boredom of the present, and longing for the future, even the eternal. All want the end, that is, an eternal line of happiness. Few will, nay, very few seek and find the means leading to this end. The greatest part of mortals overwhelms and buries these fires and impulses in their minds, leaving the rest to leisure and pleasures, or to the cares of this age. Wherefore the most numerous among the ethnics were still the most numerous, without God. Indeed, as many among the wise ethnics by their diligence, having shaken off darkness and grosser vices, have come to that light of nature, and to cultivate it by studies and honest morals, they indeed thought of God and eternity, but they thought false and useless, their thoughts are dead fish, rotten comments. They become deceived in their thoughts, the light of nature can indeed lead to the temple, but it cannot lead into the temple, and it cannot lead to God and his sanctuary without the light of the Spirit. They indeed wanted to ascend by the ladder of creatures to the Creator, but because they despised the simple ladder of the Word of God and the Holy Spirit, they trusted in their own wisdom and their own strength, therefore they fell back, like a fish leaping out of water. They fell back to their own glory by the light of nature and abused their knowledge, they did not glorify God as God, not God, but they sought their own praise in the world. Therefore, the light of grace must be added to the light of nature, so that the mind can think of divine truths and benefits, and glorify God. Of certain things, Nostratium. Matthew. It is not surprising that the Gentiles have learned falsehoods about God, because they despise the word of God and the light of the gospel spirit, but ours have the word of God and the Holy Spirit with the gospel, and yet you tell most of them to stay outside the temple and never enter. Paul. They have, but they despise and neglect just as much as the ethnics. They really want the spirit, not the fed. They want light and knowledge of truth or wisdom, but they do not want holiness. They hear the word, but do not meditate on it. If they meditate, or they do so incidentally, for the reason of the state they seek by their meditations the sustenance of life, not sanctity, or indeed seriously, but to promote the fame of the name, not to appease the hunger of the soul. They do not seek in the word of God what is necessary, but what is superfluous, not the salvation of the soul, but of the body. What is this other than to despise the word of God and the light of the Holy Spirit? Has he not despised the precious garment given to him by the prince? Meditation should be serious, simple. Who wears it in honor of all promiscuously, when it is given in honor of the prince alone? What is the need of the word of God, if you seek in it not God, but the world, not the comforts of the soul, but of the body? The abuse of this word excludes and blinds many from the temple of God. Therefore, let the meditation you wish to enter be serious and simple, serious, as to the manner, simple, as to the goal, serious, so that you can concentrate all the nerves of the soul and not by passing, but attentively meditate on the word of God. Simple, that you should not have two aims, but at least one, namely, the edification and salvation of your soul. With these meditations, he will come to you who prevents you with his grace, namely the Spirit of God, and he who gave you the will will give you to go forward, he who gave you wings, will give you wings for the divine soar. He who was the instigator of going to the temple will be the same as the introducer. He will point out and join his companions, who will take you by the hand and lead you with them. Constant? Matthew. Perhaps you think of those who once joined together as if by hand and went into the temple, Psalm 55.15, saying, Come, let us enter the house of the Lord. Micah. 4. 2. Paul. I think these, but the more numerous they once were, the fewer and rarer they are now. Beware of being offended by their fewness and cheapness. They are acted upon by the Spirit of God, and you also act with the same Spirit, unless you reject the fellowship and guidance. But hey, let your meditation also be constant, serious and simple, so that you continue meditating, continue following the guidance of the Spirit, and the examples of the companions in the way of the Divine Word. Others, if you always fall back, always burn, 
the leader will abandon you, and your companions will leave you, and thus you will never arrive at the true recognition of God and yourself. But more about these already. Keep this one thing in mind, the way to the temple of God is the pious meditation of the divine word, which unless one tramples on it, he will never enter. Chapter 5. What should I be careful about when I enter? The Towers of Human Wisdom. Matthew. You have shown the way, now show a few dangers to avoid. Paul. Beware of the high towers and palaces built around the temple. Matthew. I believe that there have been many towers on Mount Sion and other places of higher edifice, and many palaces, and from which the perspective of the temple was not unfavorably open. I think that the great and the rich stood in these, whenever they wished to amuse themselves with the contemplation of the temple, and look down from the height of the entrances on the low road. Paul? So it is. Beware of these. For thus many stand in the towers of human wisdom and authority, at least spectators of the temple, not frequenters. While these consider from a height the whole external face of the temple, and contribute with other temples in the world, they cast their eyes even as far as the Holy of Holies, but never set their feet there, but contented with their naked appearance, they amuse themselves with their own theories, and look down upon others who are below the low and contemptible path, with a high brow, and laugh at their labors. These, thinking that the entrance to the temple was not necessary, congratulated themselves that they could see all the summits and the entire circumference of the temple from the height of their wisdom, while others could scarcely see the sides of the walls and the gates. But beware of them. Do not be surprised, one, at their depth of wisdom. For they ascended thither by their own strength, not guided by the Holy Spirit, but by the Spirit of the world. Although they commend the external beauty of the temple, yet they do not commend the destruction of the beauty of the temple, which they have never seen. Matthew. Nevertheless the wisdom of the people is praised. His vanity. Paul. But from the world, not from the truly pious. For outside the temple wisdom is profane, though not as to matter, yet as to manner, looking upon and dealing with the sacred in a profane fashion, useless for sanctification, unholy. The Holy Spirit himself rejects and distinguishes it from heavenly wisdom, calling it earthly, rational, even diabolical, Jack. 3. 15.17. But this one is calm, peaceful, modest, listening to good advice, full of mercy and good fruits, not judging, and not pretending to it. The world praises them, if you want to follow the guidance of the Supreme Teacher, you praise the wisdom that he praises. 2. Do not follow the error of those who amuse themselves with bare theories. What is the use of the appearance, if it does not come with the use and entrance of the temple? What's the use of knowing if you don't want to do it? The devil is much more learned than even the most learned of mortals, and the higher he flies in the air, the more accurately he sees the exterior of the temple, but does not enter the interior, where God dwells. Matthew. But it is pleasant to know things. Paul. This variety pleases, not heals, do not be moved by the laughter of those who despise humble things as if they were well known and well worn. I would rather see the foundations of the temple with the lowly and plebeian, and enter the temple by the well-trodden path, through the gates of catechetic doctrine, than with the proud to see the summits of the temple from a height, and never enter. Romans. 12. 16. Not the high wise, but agreeable to the bumblers. Do not be wise with yourselves. 1 Corinthians. 2. 1. Sec. Let them descend from the towers of human wisdom and ambition, and let those who wish to ascend to divine wisdom enter the temple through the catechetical gate. Let those who have grown up in sacred wrongs repent, and return to the milk of the mother church, those who want to grow up rightly in divine things. The Holy Spirit on earth leads through the valley of shame to the temple, and in the temple he leads further by steps, whom he wishes to admit into the sanctuary, but the Spirit leads again from the towers of human praise in the air, and places on the roof of the temple those whom he wills to cast down into Gehenna. It is a safer place on earth, than in high places. Profanity Shop. Matthew. But we speak of them standing in the towers. They sometimes sit in the stalls around the temple, and they attract and dissuade those who enter by flattering words. Paul? And you must beware of these. If you want to enter, follow the Holy Spirit who is leading you in the way of the Word, and follow those who are leading you, 
If you have whom God has joined, and go on, with your eyes constantly fixed on the temple, Ephesians 3. 14, do not look back at what you leave behind in the world. Consider Lot's wife looking back, and turned into a statue of salt or stone. The mind is hardened, awakened by the Holy Spirit, always falling back to earthly things. Do not look to the right at the friends, sitting among the children. You will find better friends in the temple than outside. Unless you leave them, the spirit guide will leave you. Why do you hesitate to leave the society of the profane in the shops, and pass to the comfort of the saints in the temple? The friendship of the world is the enmity of God. Do not look to the left at the mockers standing in the towers, contempt of these to be avenged with contempt. Get ready for the temple, get away from yourself inside yourself, so you will neither see nor hear what others think and say about you. The Holy Spirit stirs you up in your meditations, tugs at your heart, teaches you to despise, which are outside the temple, to leave the glory of the world, to bear the shame of the world, to become, Hebrews. 10. 33. Teaches you to go straight to the temple through glory and insult, by bad and good reputation, counts the president in this example. Encouragement. Do not neglect the throbbing of the Holy Spirit, do not resent despised companions. He who neglects the pulsating Holy Spirit does not receive the indwelling one. He who despises the consortium of the pious, will not approach the contortions of the blessed. If you have been outside the temple up until now, whether at a distance or near, please do not remain any longer. It is dangerous to be outside, more dangerous to stay outside. Let him not be ashamed to descend from the high mirrors of human learning, and from the palaces of human praise, let him not be ashamed to come forth from the delightful shops of human pleasures and friendship, and enter the humble way to the temple. Let him be ashamed to despise it, to neglect it, not to continue in it, not to strive for holiness, without which no one will see God. A wish. You, most excellent Saviour, have mercy on those who are outside, as if they were in darkness and the shadow of death, and direct their feet in the way of peace, shake off all evil, disgraced, neglected, shame and numbness, and draw us by the Holy Spirit in your word, that we may run to you, that we may reach you, that we may be received into your holy company. Amen? Part 2. Those who are in the first court. Infants, and beginners in Christ. Chapter 1. What is present outside, what is lacking in the interior of the court. He is present? Matthew. We have already entered the temple, and left the profane in the shops, and the hypocrites in the towers, who are outside, I now believe that Christ our Lord is not suspicious. Paul? No, this is what he promised, 2 Corinthians. 6. 17. Come out from among them and be separated, and I will receive you. They were received into the temple either to be sanctified, or sanctifying. They took these with them, excluding the curious, who wanted not so much to clear the mind as to please the eyes. Those whom he brought with him, he profaned the temple. Thus no one enters our temple, unless he has either left the profane and proud world, or seriously wants to leave it, nay, he not only wants it, but also tries, and actually leaves it, goes out, and separates himself in mind, not in body, from the impious world. The Saviour receives them into his company, God the Father into his grace, he counts the righteous for his son's sake, he makes them holy by his spirit. Such are those whom we place in the first court, infants in Christ, or beginners in the study of piety. Not yet holy, but to be sanctified. True faith? There is, therefore, a true and living faith, as they are justified, there is a good intention, and indeed a serious one, combined with effort and diligence, to avoid evil, and to do good, by which they are sanctified. For these two articles on justification and sanctification are closely related. Matthew. But how are these things lacking in those who are outside, when they also throw faith and good intentions? Paul. No matter how much they lie, there is a lack of living faith, but there is at least an imaginary one. False faith differs from true faith as much as the thoughts which the imagination pictures in a dream, and which the mind entertains while awake, differ. True faith consoles itself by the merit of Christ against the sins committed, and resists the power of committing the merits of Christ, not obeying the irritating lusts of the flesh. He not only imputes and consoles himself, 
but also arms himself with the merit of Christ, 1 Peter. 4. 1, on one side for battle, on the other for rest, because it is not until after battle that true peace of mind it was obtained. At least false faith imputes and comforts itself, it does not arm itself, it does not fight, but voluntarily yields and obeys the coming lusts. He imagines to himself a rest in the merit of Christ, before the battle, without fighting, but the falsehood, which the day will once reveal. In those, then, outside the temple, faith dreams in those who are within, it watches and lives, as when dreaming of a temple, he sings to himself many things more splendid than what he sees and experiences when he is awake, thus those, especially the hypocrites in the towers, have much more excellent and finer thoughts about faith, and hence they speak more lavishly, than those who have simple, but effective and lively thoughts. Their faith is in imagination, on account of these. Faith is the divine light shining and burning, shining in the understanding, and enlightening him to the knowledge of our injustice and divine justice, of our perversion, of divine rectitude, burning in the will, and inflaming it to hatred of injustice and love of justice. Painted fire does not burn, thus the fantastic faith is not true and alive. Good purpose. Matthew. But since we have come into the temple to the interior, describe, as it were, the state of the human mind, such as was once whole, now corrupted and again repaired, so that I may understand it more correctly, concerning faith and good purpose. Paul. This cannot be fully and perfectly described except by those who have not yet attained the full and perfect knowledge of themselves to which we are striving. However, as far as I have been given to know, it seems the state of mind when the best Saviour says, the kingdom of God is within you, not foolishly to be compared with the kingdom. The king in this kingdom is the will, the next counsellor is the intellect. The servants of the interior, the interior senses, especially the imagination of the understanding, the sensual appetite serving the will. The external servants are the external senfus, by whose service all external things reach the king. Here once was the sweetest order and obedience. Whatever the counsellor, enlightened by divine wisdom, proposed to the king, the king freely chose it as appropriate or not appropriate, and was executed in order and promptness by the nearer ministers, that is, by persuading the appetite and concupiscence, and by the more remote ones, that is, by commanding the senses and external members, but the perversion and confusion that followed in the mind is already horrible. The servants rule, the king makes these counsellors. Whatever the eye sees and the ear hears in the world, the appetite immediately covets. If reason remonstrates, it is held under a kind of captive fantasy, to whom good appears which is not, if the will slowly consents, it is snatched away from appetite and concupiscence, and is forced to consent. The state of mind is so perverse that they are forced to serve those who ought to rule. In most mortals a sensitive appetite, or a tyrant, will occupy the royal throne. Who live a warlike life, like the ancients of old. In some cases reason emerges and struggles, as in the ethnic sages. But because, by the grace of imagination, he banishes the former tyrant from his throne, a certain imagination is left in the counsellor, distending his whole mind as if a womb filled with wind, and saying, I am better than others. But in the king there remains obstinacy, saying, I yield to no one. And as once the divine reason was governed and relied upon by wisdom, so now it is governed and relied upon by one's own wisdom. A king formerly dependent on God, now dependent on himself, seeks not God's honor, but his own honor. The more he returns to himself, the more he departs from God, the closer he comes to diabolical malice. The human mind is thus corrupted by the fall, because we are born without the fear and love of God. The Holy Spirit, therefore, by the word of God, restores the former state of the soul, liberates the first reason from captivity and places it on the throne of freedom, then he leads reason itself captive to the obedience of faith, through which it connects the mind turned away from God with God again. It takes away from the intellect the windy impression of its own wisdom, brings true knowledge of divine wisdom. He takes away, with his will, persistence and confidence in himself, he brings an inclination to God, love and trust in God, so that he no longer wants to rule by his own wisdom, but by God's wisdom, not by his own powers, but by God's powers, and to depend on the divine guidance. The Holy Spirit restores and directs the king, and the king then his subjects. Sincere love of justice. Matthew. 
But what of the holy scriptures do they teach here, Paul? Paul the Apostle seems to have met here. If you read his epistles carefully 1 Thessalonians 5. 23. Hebrews. 4. 12. 1 Peter 2. 11. Judges 19. You will see him distinguish these three things in his mind, 1. Appetite. 2. The soul. 3. The spirit. It seems to me that these things can be explained in such a way that is the sensitive appetite sitting on the throne and reigning Titus. 3. 3. Colossians. 3. 5. Reason left to itself, governing itself by its wisdom. 1 Corinthians. 2. 14. 15. 45. Romans. 8. 16. Reason turned to God, or intellect enlightened by faith, will inflamed by charity. For in these, as it were, the nobler parts of the soul, its repair begins. When the king is restored, the subjects are more easily composed. From these it is evident that the light of faith is not kindled in imagination, but in reason, for here it is windy and breezy, but here is a solid and industrious knowledge and recognition of the truth, which effectively moves the will, in which the good intention is always to be combined with faith, to embrace the truth, the will, moved and impelled, impels the whole mind to cast out those things which are contrary to the divine truth, and thus our hearts are purified by faith. And all these things happen spontaneously, from the consideration of the love and merit of Christ, so faith generates charity, and through charity it effectively moves, purifies and composes the whole mind. Matthew. But where do you prove that imaginary faith, which consists in the mere imputation of Christ's merits, is not sufficient, where we do not at the same time experience the power of Christ against sins, but that such effective and laborious faith is required. Paul does not, 1, expressly say the Holy Scripture, Jas. 2. 22 Faith cooperates with works etc. Philippians 6. Let the communication of faith be effective in the recognition of all good, etc. Galatians 5. 6. Faith working through charity. Colossians. 2. 12. He inculcates, therefore, not an idle faith, which leaves the mind to be used, but a laborious faith, which always changes the mind for the better, etc. 2. Faith is based on the Word of God. But the Word is living and effective, Hebrews. 4. 12. Works on the faithful. 1 Thessalonians. 2. 13. Is the word of life, Philippians, 2, 16. The Holy Spirit within. As thoughts in the mundane are not empty dreams playing in the mind, but vital actions affecting the mind, thus the meditations of faith in the word of life must be such vital actions affecting and changing the mind. 3. True faith and the Holy Spirit are always joined together, Ephesians. 1. 13. Galatians. 3. 2. But the Spirit is the life-giving Spirit. 2 Corinthians. 3. 6. Where there is no quickening, there is no faith. 4. Faith brings Christ. In Christ there is no lie, such as believing in Christ's redemption from sins, and yet always serve sins, but the truth, that we may put down the old man with lies, etc. Ephesians. 4. 21. 25. Matthew. I don't want any more. I understand well enough that those who, outside the temple, at least have an imaginary law of faith, are beginning hours with a living and effective faith in the court. What do they really have with respect to the ingredients in the temple? It is needed. Growth. Paul. They have an indwelling spirit, Romans. 8. 11. When they have a throbbing sound, Revelation. 3. 20. It is better to live than to knock somewhere. God dwells in the temple, those who are in our temple, the Saviour also dwells in them by faith, as he promised, I will dwell in them, etc. which happens when, through frequent meditations, Christ is made somewhat more familiar and familiar to our hearts than he was when he entered. Matthew. But what is lacking with regard to those who are in the inner courts? Paul. Ours have the beginnings of true faith and the indwelling spirit, 
but the growths are lacking. The beginnings of faith are small, therefore faith must always grow and increase. They are weak, and therefore must always be established. In the first court the mind is still fluctuating, in the second it is more established and robust in spirit. He is living in the spirit, Galatians. 5. 26. 16. There, walking in the spirit, and at last it is done, walking in spirit. Firmness. For it is one state to have Christ indwelling, another to have him walking. Babies live, but not until they can walk. Those who are advanced learn to walk, or for elsewhere they are the first rudiments. Adults walk readily, which is. First of all, consider with me that Galatians. 4. 19. My children, whom I will give birth to again, until Christ is formed in you. From this we learn that Christ is first sketched in infants, then more fully depicted and decorated in advanced children, just as painters first sketch, then illuminate and decorate their pictures. They also have a certain form of piety outside the temple, 2 Timothy. 3. 5. But falsehood at least in external manners without virtue. The children in the court first have her in mind with power. Those who progress have the same form and image of Christ in their minds, fed with more virtue. Matthew. But what is the use of having Christ thus drawn and depicted in the mind? Paul. Then follows a desire for the virtues of Christ, and a hatred of vices. For those who have the image of Christ crucified in their minds as if turned before their eyes, Galatians. 3. 1. They often sigh, Oh, how perverted I am, how just and holy my Saviour! Oh, if I could be as just, chaste, self-controlled, meek, patient, and humble as he was! Oh, how great the splendour of his virtues, how wretched my vices! Conform me to your image, best Jesus! etc. This is present to our madman in the temple, it is lacking even among the most educated outside the temple, who desire the teaching of Christ without the life of Christ. And this is it I would like Paulinus. Romans. 7. 15. Outside the temple is idle and ineffective, at least to want, such as those who are lazy, who wish for what they think are impossible, who want the end, and they do not want the means, whence they sometimes wish for justice, but they do not hate, nor do they want to put down their injustice. In the true temple there is an efficacious desire combined with a hatred of one's own corruption and a desire for the righteousness of Christ and an effort to imitate him. Outside the temple, the mind is tortured when it cannot rise to the height of those who stand in palaces and towers, or when it is despised by those who sit in shops. In the temple the mind is tormented when it cannot do what it wants and desires, or when it reluctantly returns to what it hates and condemns, groaning, who will deliver me from the body of this death. Of course, he is drawn unwillingly to those things to which others return voluntarily. He wishes to be freed from the sins which others desire to serve. He deplores those things which others laugh at and do with scorn. Therefore there is in the temple a hatred of sin and a sincere desire for justice, when outside the temple it is salted and disguised. For they do not hate the guilt of sin, but at least the punishment. They do not desire justice itself, but the reward of justice. But the pious in the temple, though still infants, are yet ingenuous, and hate what is evil, viz. Before God, not in so far as it is harmful to themselves, they love good as good, not in so far as it is convenient for themselves, but acceptable to God. They show the sincerity of hatred and love and longing, which they do not, what is their own, as hypocrites outside the temple, but what is God's, they seek only. Therefore, although the desire in the first court is still weak, if you look at those who are in the inner courts, and are moved by more ardent desires, it is nevertheless sincere, with respect to those who are outside, and because of this God is pleased and accepted to sanctify our children. Matthew. We have talked about faith and bond purpose, hatred and longing, in which truth and sincerity are present to us. Beatitude. What lacks those who are outside, there is a lack of stability, where they rejoice who are inside, but are they not happy in this state too? Paul? Why not? Hear the Saviour himself, Matthew, v. 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. 
Blessed before the world are those who desire and obtain the shadow and mask of righteousness, but happier before God are those who hunger and thirst for true justice itself. These are filled with the shadow of vanity, these are the truth of the matter. And although they are filled more abundantly, just as adults take more, yet our recruits are satisfied and fulfilled, as much as they take for their state. They taste the kindness of Christ, unknown to those who are outside. And the more they taste, the more they hunger and thirst. Those who once were led to the Temple of Solomon for the first time, marveled at its splendor, and longed to go further and see more, so our recruits with the admission, and they experience with delight the sweetest power of the divine word and the splendor of truth. As the children, being brought into the palace, survey everything with their eyes, they linger on everything, marveling at the unusual luster. So there are no strings attached to be admired in all the words of the scriptures. Behold, how truly the Holy Spirit said this. How accurately he marked out the things which are sufficient for salvation, which are necessary for us against the enemies, the flesh, the world, and the devil. How stupid I was, reading these things before and not paying attention, not understanding correctly, etc. These attract the mind to seek and find more, even though we do not think that we can find greater ones because of our surprise. We always see greater things, as the Lord said to Nathaniel, marveling at his omniscience, you will see these greater things. And when we hear these things, our desire is kindled to see that there are still greater and more excellent ones left. Oh, how lovely are the tabernacles, how lovely are the dwellings of God! I would rather be here last, and stand near the gate, than dwell for a long time in the most splendid palaces of the world, and stand among the first. Blessed are those who so thirst for justice. Chapter 2. Of their struggles and infirmities. Matthew. This outer area of the temple is sometimes called the court of the nations. Why this? Paul? Here the common people of the Jews had their cells or chambers built, like the Levites in the interior, the priests in the innermost part of the temple. It was therefore lawful for them to bring with them into this first court Gentiles who had not yet been circumcised, but who were to be circumcised, if they wished further to lead the uncircumcised in flesh and heart, Ezekiel. 44. 9. They were not allowed to be thrown into the interior of the temple without profaning it. Against the appetite of the flesh. Sacrifices are also seen to have been slaughtered in this place, and to have been burnt and offered in the interiors, where the altars were built. Here therefore begins the circumcision of the heart, the mortification of the flesh, the crucifixion of carnal desires. In most people the appetite rises above the mind, and dominates the mind tyrannically. Therefore, the Holy Spirit attacks this enemy first to restore his mind and cleanse his home. The first struggle is against the appetites of the flesh, whose tyrannical and unjust rule the enlightened soul sees, and is no longer willing to bear when born again. Refer here to what the Apostle of the Gentiles says, Galatians. 5. 17. The flesh lusteth against the spirit, but the spirit against the flesh, for these things are opposed to one another, so that you may not do whatever you will. The Holy Spirit cannot bring his enemy's desire into the temple of the heart with him. Therefore he struggles against him, the flesh resists, but the spirit finally resists, as long as we remain in the temple and follow his lead. Matthew. It occurs to me what is said about David and Saul, too. Samuel. 3. 1. And there was a long war between the house of Saul, and David went and was strengthened, and the house of Saul went and was crushed. Paul? These things are subject to an opportune time. For thus in this struggle the spirit must be strengthened, concupiscence must be weakened and crushed. Matthew. But what do you desire, do you understand? Paul? Disorderly and intemperate. For the Spirit of God does not want to remove nature, but the confusion of sensitive appetites and emotions. Appetite is either concupiscible or irascible. The former sins, one, by coveting illicit and forbidden things, such as those of his neighbors, when envy, greed, etc. Two, lawful in an unlawful manner, as when concerning food, drink, sleep, clothes, house, etc. and other necessities, not necessity, but luxuries, from which arise lust, lust, pride, and other similar vices. The latter sins either by exceeding the object or the method, from which hatred, wrath, 
and all the vicious anger proceed to the offspring. Thus the spirit attacks these things, and desires to destroy them, to remove them, and thus to bring the affections into order, and to subject them to a correct reason. Matthew. But why cannot the Holy Spirit bear those disordered desires? Paul? Because they contradict the most holy life of Christ, whose image he had already drawn in his mind. Of course the concupiscible appetite with its progeny is opposed to the temperance, chastity, continence, quietness, and diligence of the Saviour, he is angry, with kindness, meekness, patience, and humility. Before these virtues can be planted in the mind and grow, it is clear that first the faults must be eradicated. Matthew. But how does the Spirit fight against this enemy? Paul? In the same way in which he fights, namely by lusting. The flesh lusts, the Spirit lusts against it, the flesh thinks, the Spirit thinks against it, Caro advises, the Spirit advises against it. And thus he resists all the efforts of the flesh, opposing good thoughts to evil thoughts, and the truths of spiritual things to vain desires. As the flesh hinders the spirit, how much less can he pray properly, speak good things, and act as he wishes, thus the spirit hinders the flesh, so that it is less able to commit sins. Where these things are in the heart, there you will seldom hear sin in your mouth, you will seldom see it in your work. The Holy Spirit breaks sin in thoughts and desires, and tries to suppress the germs of vice at the very beginning. Matthew. For whose end does he attack and attack concupiscences in this way? Paul. That he might rescue from them the throne and dominion, which should not be in one battle, but gradually and often repeated times. That he may keep them in order under the obedience of the reborn will, that they may no longer pollute the abode of the heart, that they may not hinder the divine worship and prayers in the temple of the heart, that the mind may arise freely and call upon God with truths and saints. For God wants to be worshipped in spirit and in truth, in a spontaneous spirit, and free from the tyranny of the flesh, with the truth of the heart, not with the hypocrisy of the mouth. Matthew. I noted before that it was said of David in the singular number, he went and was strengthened. Of the house of Saul in the plural. They went on and on. What is this? Paul? So and here one against many. The Holy Spirit is one, there are many and many forms of lust. For who is the innumerable train of concupiscence before the vain and vain desires in the world? Will he count the things that invade his mind every day? But the Spirit resists all these, one is sufficient for all. They succumb to ignorance. One concupiscence having been exhausted, it attacks another, and so he continues until he has overcome them all. He could indeed prostrate them all at one blow, but he prefers to uproot them successively, so that, seeing the greatness of our danger and the divine beneficence, by which we are freed from the dominion of the flesh, we may be drawn to greater gratitude towards God, and meekness towards our neighbor who sins. For the memory of a favor, which is done quickly, quickly perishes in our hearts. Matthew. You said before that the beginnings of the Spirit are weak, and it is also known elsewhere that victory is difficult at the beginning of a war. Does the Spirit also succumb in this battle against the flesh? Paul? He succumbs indeed, but he must always rise again more courageous. This is what Paul says, Romans. 7. 23. I see another law in my members, contrary to the law of my mind, and capturing me in the law of sin, which is in my members etc. Before the mind served the sinful affections or concupiscences as if it were a competent lord willingly and willingly, it will now be brought back unwillingly and held captive under the tyranny of the flesh, until the deliverer of the spirit comes to the rescue again. Matthew. I hear those who are outside also use this saying to excuse their sins. Paul. But it is a very different reason. They go of their own accord into captivity, into which they are dragged unwillingly they rejoice, they groan under captivity. They prefer to serve perpetually, rather than struggle with trouble and difficulty to get ready, they wish, ask and get their freedom again. Wherefore Paul, when he had said, Who shall deliver me, etc. he adds, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, liberation and victory. For he is the one who gives victory everywhere, as he teaches elsewhere to Corinthians. 2. 14. No malice. Matthew. But whence is it that the spirit succumbs, when in infinite ways the flesh becomes stronger? 
Paul. This is done by the most wise counsel of God, that we may acknowledge our nothingness, that we have nothing from ourselves, but from God we can have everything, and let us be preserved from pride, which has conquered many, after they have conquered their vices. Matthew. I don't want that, but how it happens that they sin. Who hate sins and have said goodbye to them. Paul. That is why I said that those who will not consent, but those who do not, are drawn away to sin, before they can take up the weapons of the Spirit against the flesh. They do not sin from the malice of the will, as those outside, but either from rashness or ignorance. For as the devil, the external enemy, by force and fraud, so the appetite, the internal adversary, snatches away by violence, and seduces the mind by fraud. The vehemence of the irascible appetite seizes us, so that the tongue runs through the mind, let us say before we think, the concupiscible seduces us, so that we taste, before we decide whether it is good or bad, thinking that it does no harm, when in reality it does harm. He bursts in, here he insinuates himself. His vehemence is restrained by vehement restraint, this fraud is avoided by careful abstinence. For they are inordinate appetites of passion, seductive concupiscence. Ephesians. 4. 22. Seducers are prudently to beware. Hebrews. 3. 13. There the Holy Spirit teaches us to fight bravely, watch carefully here. And thus the mind will finally reach its freedom, victory is not given before the battle. Matthew. Can concupiscence be suppressed by these means, so that the mind becomes free and calm? Paul. What could they do? For why does he fight, except that he may win? Why does he win, except to free and calm the mind of the Holy Spirit? They must fight in order to win. When will the mind of Christ finally arrive at the peace of Christ, if it refuses to expel the enemies of peace, the vicious affections of course? There can be no peace unless the enemies are defeated. And the mind must tend to it in this court, to be sanctified in the first place, so that it may strip away all vicious affections. Matthew. I remember that he drove our Saviour out of this place of the temple, and indeed on two occasions, selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and overthrew the tables of the cashiers, with scattered coins. Paul. What does this signify, except that such impure concupiscence of cattle, sheep, and money are not to be brought into the temple of the heart, but to be completely expelled, so that we may pray with a pure heart? For the house of God is a house of wealth, not of commerce. But he did this twice, that is to say, at the beginning and end of his ministration, what else is this, than that concupiscences, whenever they return, must always be expelled, not at least at the beginning, but at the end of the spiritual struggle. For they are impudent, like the devil, who, having been repulsed or cast out, always returns. It must therefore be very little allowed that concupiscence, returning from time to time, pollutes the temple of the heart. Matthew. The Lord made a scourge on the corpses, whom the merchants themselves had brought, whom he drove out with this passion. Paul. Thus concupiscence can be cut by the throat with a sword. For what is more absurd than to want to seek and long for earthly things in spiritual things, on the way to heaven? With these cords he binds and strangles himself, by the coming of the Holy Spirit, the impurity and vanity of concupiscence, so that there is no need for many arguments in the matter to manifest. Matthew. When the first time the Lord cast out the merchants from the temple, he gently rebuked them, saying, Take these things away. And do not satiate my father's house by trading it. Rebuking him the other time more severely, he said, It is written, My house is the house of the kingdom, but you have made it a den of thieves. Paul. Thus, the more often they return, the more seriously they are to be argued, the more diligently they are to expel their lusts. For the mind, having not long struggled with lusts, and yielding to them and allowing them dominion again, becomes a house of commerce, in which, indeed, in vain, yet evils are not always done. But the mind, which has long been in conflict with the same, and defeated, where it has nearly won, is a den of robbers, where nothing but extreme malice and impiety is found. He that cast out Satan twice or thrice, and receives again and again, his later things become worse than the former. But he who is constant in the struggle and expulsion of vices, his mind is finally healed and purified, and raised to a better state. 
Explanation of the example of Christ cleansing the temple. Matthew. Perhaps the words conjoined from the same place indicate this. For after the Lord had cleansed the temple, it is immediately added, and the blind and lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. Heals the blind and lame. Paul. Nay, after the mind has been cleansed of vices, our blind ignorance, by which vices seduced us, is also healed. The limping impotence, which the vicious affections seized upon us, is healed, and the Spirit frees our eyes to avoid the frauds of sin, and our feet, so that we may rise from sin, walk in the temple, and continue further in the way of holiness. Chapter 3. Of Boredom and Other Dangers and Their Hindrances. Weary of the Struggle. Matthew. But it is difficult and troublesome to always be engaged in struggle, always as if to fight with wild beasts, that is, to struggle and wrestle against wild concupiscences. The mind will hardly be able to endure this battle for long. Paul? No, he can do nothing by himself, therefore the Lord must be asked, to supply strength, to heal the weakness and lameness in the mind, to give him watchful eyes against those who insinuate themselves, and feet that stand strong against the breaking in of vicious emotions. For unless the reborn mind becomes stronger and wiser every day, it cannot be overcome. Matthew. Nevertheless, all unaccustomed labor is at first troublesome and breeds weariness, and we see many entering the temple with joy, and returning with weariness. Paul? The same and here usually happens to our recruits, because their strength is still weak, because the enemy persistently shouts, they return shamelessly, because the spirit, having succumbed several times, has risen sharply, because the victory is still in doubt, because they see nothing but battles, their mind is easily exhausted by their troubles, and abandoned by the hope of reformation, he returns to the profane shops in the temple. Dangerous Induction. Matthew. But what does this mean, when he can again return to the temple and begin his struggle again? Paul? It hurts the most. For it impedes progress in sanctification, and victory against enemies, and tranquility of mind. The slower you fight, the longer you drag out the war. As much as you give to the flesh, so much do you take away from the spirit. The more often the mind is drawn back, and always strikes against the same stone, the stronger the flesh becomes, the weaker the spirit. Until at last it failed completely, and was brought back to its former worst condition. It must be overcome, unless you overcome the flesh, the flesh will overcome you. Matthew. Are they too dangerously involved in this fight? Is it even harmful to go out of the temple while mourning and come back? To persevere. Paul? It is so. Outside the temple the spirit is enervated by carnal recreations. In the temple he is strengthened in the battle itself, which at the beginning is heavy, but by habit becomes light. And unless the soul grows in the temple, it easily decreases outside the temple and fails completely. Hence the apostles exhort the beginning Christians so earnestly not to succumb in the least, not to be moved in the least by tribulations, not to be in any way frightened by those who oppose them. 1 Thessalonians. 3. 3. Philippians. 1. 28. For many cheerfully begin the battle in the temple, but shamefully abandon it and flee outside the temple to the vanity of the towers or the profanity of the shops. The Christian nation has more fierce enemies than those who thus reject the sacred initiation of the Christian. As the Jews had no more bitter despisers of their temple, except those who had been led thither, refused to be led any further, but returned with disgust to their Gentile manners. Matthew. Whence arises the fatigue in our recruits? From excessive tenderness. Paul. It seems to arise. 1. From tenderness of mind. The mind of children at a tender age is pliable, soft and waxy, on which you can easily impress and take out whatever you want. He is restless, inconstant, and fond of novelty. We see the boys being introduced into the splendid palace, at first admiring everything with the greatest pleasure, and then lingering there longer with weariness. When the Israelites were led out into the desert, they first marveled at the manner, but soon became disgusted with it, falling back with longing for the oily onions of Egypt. Thus our recruits, fluctuating in this way, are easily disgusted, because before they were surprised because of the novelty, and are easily carried away by various doctrines. They therefore need the growth and strength of the Spirit, and a prudent guide, 
so that they may be fortified against this weariness and the danger of seduction. 2. From the trouble of mourning. It is troublesome to wrestle with oneself and always carry an enemy in one's bosom. The Israelites hearing in the wilderness, the land of Canaan, to which they were proceeding by troublesome journeys, driving out the giants, to be engaged in the fiercest battle, weary with so many toils, they resolved their minds, and contemplated their return to Egypt. Hence most of them, prostrated in the desert, never reached the promised land of rest. Thus, the struggles of our recruits were easily extinguished by difficulty. From the abundance of light. Before the struggle, when they feel their lusts, they are too weak, during the struggle too slow, after the struggle, if they have won, they are too swollen, if they are defeated, they are often caught too desperate. It is added that, having overcome one concupiscence, the other remains to be overcome, that first of all, which by habit has taken deeper roots in the mind, whenever it is cut off, it often regurgitates, but always in one and another way, in another form, under another pretext, now creeping up, now suddenly bursting into the mind. Tired of all this, his tender mind easily falters, and at last he plans flight rather than battle. Example of Jesus. It was as if Peter, still with tender faith, walking on the waves, seeing the waves of a huge sea, suddenly became frightened and began to sink, and would have been drowned, had not Jesus supported him with an outstretched hand. They therefore need recruits here, a leader who will preside over them and encourage them to fight, and to the counts, who, stimulated by their example, fought eagerly. Of course, as the stake of the vine, so the tenderer souls are raised and inflamed by admonitions, exhortations, and counsels. Such admonitions and counsels are most famous in the Holy Scriptures. I will add at least one thing, which, considered as a test, will dispel the tedium of the struggle. Hebrews. 12. 4. You have not yet resisted to the point of blood, resisting sin, etc. For this reason raise your hands relaxed and your knees loose, and take straight steps with your feet, so that no one may wander with a limp, but rather be healed. It seems to us that we have struggled mightily, although we have not yet resisted to the point of bleeding. Let us look at the example of our leader. Of Christ, who struggled so much that he shed his blood in the garden and on the cross, do we not struggle so, and yet retire weary? At least that suits the soldiers of Christ. But the battle must be renewed, strength must be gathered in the weary hands and faltering knees, and to stand with a firm foot in the battle against sin. And why do we not fight bravely, when we have the promise of victory, the strengthening spirit, and holy comrades who fight the same battle and win by the power of Christ? Unless we do this, the thigh of our mind will be completely distorted and will degenerate for the worse. A sluggish mind easily becomes limping, soon completely powerless and unfit to fight. If we do, the lameness will be cured. For he who diligently uses the powers granted to him by God, they are granted greater powers. From the gates of the temple you close the inner ones, open to the higher ones. Matthew. What if the forces are not yet present? Paul. Stay in the temple, ask for prayers and wait for divine help. He who is to sail remains in the port, not proceeding to the sea, not retreating to the land, but remaining on the shore and waiting for a favorable wind. Thus let our sanctified soldier remain in the temple, continue meditating, praying, fighting and watching against himself, and thus expect the Spirit to lead further. Matthew. But this is troublesome to the apprentices, who are wandered hither and thither by their desires, and cannot easily be drawn back to the exterior, and cannot go to the interior. Paul? That is why I think their boredom arises, three, from the gates being closed on the inside and open on the outside. The doors to the interior of the temple are closed, because God first tests each son whom he receives, is it true that he will use the grace given to fight faithfully? For he who is faithful in the lesser things, are they entrusted with the greater things? God tests the pious by opening the doors to the exterior, do they wish to continue in constant struggle and toil, or to return to pleasures outside the temple? Those who do not stand this test, let them be rejected, but those who endure, Hebrews. 11. 25. Those who choose to be afflicted with the people of God rather than to have the temporal pleasure of sin, they are strengthened in good and are led further. 
when the gates are open to the outside, when they look at the recruits here in the towers rejecting and condemning them, and there in the shops laughing at them and carrying away their plans, the mind, not yet strengthened, is easily overturned, and is moved away from the enterprise. It is therefore of no use to look more often to those things which are carried on outside the temple, much less to go out. It is better to shut the doors of the mind, or to chastise the ears and eyes with license, to remain within oneself, and to abstain from the intercourse of men for so long, until the mind is restrained in irascibility, and being fortified by abstinence from concupiscible things, and strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit against the threats and allurements of the world, he can go forth without his own danger to the edification of others. For the recruits are not yet able to consult for themselves, much less for others. Matthew. They submit here as long as they exist, Ezek. 46. 9. Where those who have entered the temple by the southern gate, are commanded to go out by the northern gate, situated on the opposite side, and now by that gate by which they came. Paul. The pious are warned that it is dangerous to return to the company which they left outside the temple when they entered. For they will easily draw back our minds, which are not yet sufficiently strengthened, to themselves and their profane manners, or diminish the desire of good and the hatred of evil in our hearts. Therefore, if it pleases us to go out of the temple, or to relax our minds, let us go out by another gate, lest we see our former consorts, nor be again taken away by their contagion and profaned. However, it was safest to stay in the temple and devote yourself diligently to sanitization. Chapter 4. Or is this to be stopped at all in the court? At least. Matthew. But should we stop here? Paul? Not at all. Matthew. Yet many think that it is sufficient to go out to the temple, and to return, to pollute the hands outside, and to wash them again inside, to break off the struggle, and to begin again, to be profane in the shops, and to be holy in the temple. Paul? These are most dangerously. 1. The apostles expressly urge the continuation of sanctification, perfecting sanctity and elsewhere. 2. It is dangerous, as we have said, to remain in this state. For a tender and fluctuating mind is easily seduced. Therefore Saint Paul wants us to grow, and not to remain children, that we may beware of the various seductions and frauds of the devil. Ephesians. 4. 15. That is why he wants the heart to be made firm by grace, so that the mind is no longer carried away by various doctrines, Hebrews. 13. 9. Unstable souls are easily drawn back to sins, and cannot be sure of their salvation, 2 Peter. 3. 16. Therefore Saint Peter wills, 2 Peter. 1. 10. 11. That we should be diligent in the good works by which we are sanctified, so that we may make our calling and election firm, no longer, as recruits are wont, to impinge, but to have an entrance into the kingdom of Christ abundantly supplied, and thus be assured of our salvation. Matthew. However our obedience has at least begun in this life. Paul. Well, what has been begun is not always to be begun but to be continued, not to be broken off, so that it is always necessary to begin again. He who always begins to live lives badly. Matthew. But the flesh obstructs and breaks it off, for he lusts against the spirit. Certain exceptions. Paul. The source of carnal concupiscence must be blocked, so that the source of spiritual concupiscence may flood the whole soul with living and pure water. Not only to wrestle against the flesh, but to wrestle. Not to the combatant, but to the lawful combatant, and to the conqueror shall the crown be given. 2 Timothy 2. 5. Matthew. But no one lives without sins. Paul. Right, even if he lives without these coarser things, he does not live without the finer ones. You will find in your heart more deviations from the norm of divine rectitude than lust, but which can only be detected and corrected by taming these. There are excrements of the first, there are of the second, there are of the third digestion. The contamination of the flesh is given. The contamination of the spirit is given. Deposited with the coarser excrements of concupiscence and sensitive appetite, let us proceed to other defilements of imagination and reason. There will always be room left for further growth in sanctification. It must continue until death, when it will be completed. Matthew. 
But if the recruits died in this state, would they not die happy? Paul? They indeed die happy, but they do not live happily unless they continue. For that reason the Lord grants a longer life, because he wants to lead further in holiness. If those who deny themselves here, do not live for Christ, but for themselves, and for their own belly, they do not want to serve the Lord, which is the false Christians outside the temple. Matthew. I hear many people saying that it is absolutely impossible to control the mind in such a way that you never exceed the limit in lusting or anger, or that the appetite cannot be so subjugated and tamed that it is always ready for the mind. Paul? If it is simply impossible, it must be imputed either to God or to us. If God, either unwilling, or unable, through his Spirit, to restore our minds to the correctness of the image of Christ, to which he reformed the minds of the apostles and the first Christians, both of which are absurd even in thought. It is left, therefore, that the fault must be imputed to us, because we do not want to be brought back to that rectitude of mind. We see the light, but we love our darkness more than our light. Don't be at fault, it is claimed that it cannot be. Does it seem to you that it is only possible to control your desires or emotions, so that they do not break out into indecent words or deeds? Can it be that we see, who are outside, can do that sometimes? Matthew. They do, but, as you say, sometimes at least, in the presence of men whom they fear and fear, not always and everywhere as in the presence of God. Then they do it for the love of praise before men, not for the love of sanctification before God. Paul? Well, if, therefore, the spirit of pride, the fear of men, and the love of worldly praise, can rest so much continence and abstinence from the mind, what if the spirit of grace, the fear and love of God could cleanse the mind from evil lusts, and lead to it, so that we can call on God with our hearts and serve the world in the holiness and justice that pleases him. As the spirit of the world before the world teaches to do all things decently, rightly and blamelessly, so the spirit of God before God. Matthew. No, I think so, it is enough for me to invoke God with a pure heart, if I abstain from more serious excesses, such as, for example, thefts and adulteries, etc. and after lighter excesses, that is to say, an unexpected crime committed not by me, but for the sake of my friends, after the provocation of the spirit of others, having been provoked in the courts, breaking out into angry words, I will return to myself, and ask forgiveness for Christ's sake. The holiness of Christ will supply the rest. Paul? This is not to pray with a holy and pure heart, but with a polluted one, nay, to pray with polluted mouth and hands. It must be borne very little, when the source of concupiscence always pollutes the interior of the heart through thoughts and desires, therefore the spirit fights against it, because it does not want to bear it, and at last it purifies the heart, if we proceed diligently and diligently. And you permit, moreover, the external parts to be polluted, and nevertheless you think that you pray with a pure heart. The heart is polluted by appetite, reigning in the mouth with angry words, reigning in the tongue by excessive drinking, slander, rash judgment, reigning in the eyes by looking at a chaste woman, reigning in the ears by hearing vain and playful rather than serious and useful, reigning in the hands by playing, reigning in the feet by dancing and dancing and you say that, despite these things, you can pray with a pure heart. Do you not know what is holy, what is profane, what is impure, what is pure before God? There remain many more and finer defects in the mind, which Christ, while we are sanctified, he covers with his own merit, so that there is no need to cover these gross filth of carnal concupiscence, abused by the most holy merit of Christ, especially when you do not want your mind to be cleansed from those filth, always returning to them, like a pig to a pen. The grace of the New Testament requires greater holiness. You know that the Jews did not stop at this in the court, but went on to the interior, when they offered their sacrifices. For in this court there was no altar on which sacrifices could have been offered, but they stood in the interior. And so you have here no altar, no merit of Christ, as long as you remain, as long as you suffer concupiscences, which you call infirmities, to rule in heart and mouth and limbs. Beware, therefore, of repeated excesses of this kind, and frequent going out into the temple, in the morning in the temple, continue diligently in the struggle against the flesh, until the gate is open for you to enter further, having conquered and tamed hundreds of lusts. There, by the sprinkling of the blood of Christ, 
you will be able to resist your offenses more severely, and you will be able to serve God with a purer and calmer heart. Chapter 5. How to Proceed to the Inner Court. Matthew. You said I must go on, but who shall go, if the gate be closed? Paul? First look around, have you properly died in this struggle against concupiscence? Perhaps you have not renounced some, but not all. Sometimes the mind, shaken by the rest, reserves a single concupiscence for itself, which then infects the whole mind with the poison of hypocrisy. And this is what was more familiar to him than the rest, either through the vice of the age, or through his own custom. Examine yourself. Matthew. How shall I know that? Paul. Examine this age, in which drunkenness and avarice stand out above all the other vices, foretold by the Saviour of old, Luke. 21? 34. But I have already brought it to no one, as marked faults, because the custom prevailed everywhere and indecency, and he took up infamy. Think whether you have contracted some vice from this habit, too, which, however, you do not yet believe to be against temperance, and the sufficiency of Christ. Such vicious feelings tend to insinuate themselves more deeply and are more difficult to recognize and eradicate. Then shake your temper, whether you are sanguine to lust and foolishness, or choleric to anger, or melancholic to suspicions and chatter, or phlegmatic to his appetite and more prone to acedia. Indeed, the mind of all mortals has been corrupted through the fall by love of self and hatred of neighbor, whence arrogance, envy, avarice, lust, anger, and a host of other vices are easily prognosticated, but this difference arises from temperament, from education, and from other circumstances, so that one is found to be more infected with this and another with another vice. And the vices which are thus contracted, also remain more intimate, for custom is second nature, and for that reason they are more difficult to let go and are rooted out later. Examine yourself here, do you hate even these vices, which are familiar to you by habit, and try to eradicate them. And here in the court you have the first steps to ascend some higher and to grow in hatred of sin. The first is acknowledgement, see whether you acknowledge your faults, which are very familiar and habitual to you, that is to say, the ease of swearing, cursing, mocking, judging one's neighbor at random, and other vices of language. Perhaps you do not yet recognize these things, for they are more difficult, the less used, to be known. So go here to find out. The second step is detestation, perhaps you recognize, but you have not yet detested it, continue, therefore, in detesting the vices of your family. The third is flight. And from here is your frequent exit from the temple, or slip and excess. Here you must proceed with the greatest care, so that you carefully avoid even the smallest occasion, by which you know that your vicious affection is irritated. And when you thus grow in hatred towards your sins, you will reach and ascend to the gate which leads to the interior. Matthew. Nay, the father often tries to flee from such opportunities, but God has not yet given him the strength. Prayer. Paul, see to it that the fault does not rest on you, God gave you strength, you, perhaps, kissing the same owl, preferred to decline the battle, rather than to undergo it. Examine yourself, are you always on the watch for the fraud of your flesh, or do you resist strongly the violence of your flesh? The Spirit showed you the whole armor, you did not wear it diligently. You did not always keep the loins of your mind tight for the battle, but you often relaxed it carelessly, wherefore you do not accuse the Holy Spirit but yourself. If, however, strength were lacking, could you not ask? Do you not know the voice of the Saviour, ask and it will be given to you? And it is the same way by which you can go to the interior and be admitted. Go on by the way you entered the temple, viz. By meditation, by temptation, which takes place in struggle, by prayer. And when thou comest to the gate, pray first. Ask and you shall receive, seek, and you shall find, knock, and it shall be opened unto thee, for he that seeketh shall receive, and he that seeketh shall find, and it shall be opened unto him that knocketh. Matthew. I knocked several times, but it was not yet opened. Paul. You knocked, but perhaps casually, not diligently, you went away weary of your work, and did not ardently desire the opening of the gate. When you first entered the temple, this gate seemed open to you, for all the gates of the temple corresponded to each other in diameter, 
so that the first ingredient also appeared to be the innermost. And therefore it was clear to you, that you might see the splendor of the temple, and therefore God wanted you to see, that you might long for him. For there is no desire for the unknown. Already after you entered and began to dwell in the first court, God closed it, so that you could knock with desire. For he willingly gives his spirit, but to those who ask and long for it. Matthew. No, I knocked with great desire, and yet it is not open. Paul. Think, perhaps your mind is not yet sufficiently prepared to receive a greater grace. Perhaps you do not yet know what can be known in the first court. There were here, as in the other courts, the rooms of teachers and students, in which the more rude were informed. Walk around and visit all the cells of the catechetic doctrine, without a doubt you will come across things that remain to be learned or unlearned. Perhaps there remains some opinion to be unlearned, which hinders the progress of growing in hatred of sin, or there remains some doctrine to be learned here, which increases the love and desire of justice. For this desire must be true, sincere, humble, true, without color, sincere, without profit, or personal advantage, humble, without presumption. After having carefully visited and shaken all, return and knock, but with a humble desire, saying, Lord, if I am worthy, send me in. For God gives greater grace to those in whom the spirit of concupiscence dwells against envy, but only if they are humble. Therefore the scripture says, Jacob 4. 5. 6. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. If you return in this way, and go up to the gate by degrees, that is, by degrees of hatred of the truth, by recognition, detestation, and flight of sin, and with true confidence, sincere and humble you beat her, God will undoubtedly open the door and let you into higher things. I wish. For God is faithful, who called us to the company of his Son, 1. Corinthians? 1. 9. He will complete the good work he has begun in us. As for you, O most excellent Saviour, we owe thanks for deigning to receive us separated from the profane into this holy court of your temple. We commend to you the beginnings and growths of our faith and holiness. Protect and guide us with your Spirit, so that the soul in this court, still tender, may grow and be strengthened. Strengthen him in the difficult and troublesome struggle against the flesh. Preserve and defend against waves of doubts, against boredom and weariness, against more frequent excesses, lest he succumb too often, and at last fail altogether. Keep your mind in these dangers, and guide it in the means of going further, and of growing in hatred and longing for the truth, until it pleases you to take him to the higher places, having duly died in this court, for all the apprenticeships of the Christian soldiery. Psalm 84. 1. How beloved are your shelters, Lord of the powers! My soul longs and fails in the courts of the Lord. Fill, Lord, the innermost desires of our souls, and lead us to your inner halls to the praise of your glorious grace. Amen? Part 3. Those who are in the second court, or adolescents in Christ. Chapter 1. Of their state, with respect to the inferior and superior. The eye of faith is brighter. Matthew. We have now come, guided by God, to the second court, where we are more remote from vanities and crowds than outside the temple, and for that reason, as I think, safer against seductions, obstacles and relapses of sin. Paul? Safer indeed, but we are not entirely safe, we are still safer, because God has given us here what we long for in the first court, before we are prevented, and stronger feet against our precipitancy, so that we can withstand the onslaught of our emotions with more strength, overcome and control our wrong desires more easily, and thus, breaking through the hindrances and obstacles of the flesh, we can obey and serve God with a freer spirit. We have already entered into the Lord's powers. Psalm. 71. 16. And with the enemies of holiness, viz., wicked lusts, powerfully repressed, we begin to walk powerfully in the ways of the Lord, and to pray powerfully, or more devoutly, than before. Matthew. Perhaps you look at it, because in this court stood the altar, placed here by Solomon, when he could not offer all his sacrifices on the higher altar near the temple, and the sacrifices offered in the air consecrated for that purpose, what else do they signify in the scriptures of the New Testament, than the prayers of the saints in the name of Christ, to the Father a thousand times? The mind is stronger in Christ. 
Paul? You are right. The altar is Christ, he, of course, stands here, firmer and stronger in mind. Of course, faith is tender and fluctuating in apprentices, in youths it is more established in the doctrine of Christ, more robust in the lives of Christ. For as it was once said of him on earth, so it must now be said of him in our souls, the child grew and was strengthened by the Spirit, or, Jesus advanced in wisdom and strength, Luke. 2. 40. 52. Wisdom in doctrine, strength and stature in life, or by the firmness of doctrine against the waves of doubts, by the strength of life against the onslaught of emotions. Matthew. But is not true faith generated without doubts in the mind? Paul? I feel that way. First let there be a child who wants to grow up. We must first doubt about him, explore everything, and know for sure. As a tree is driven by the winds, so faith, driven by storms of doubts or temptations, takes deeper root in the mind. St. Peter and James call this a proof of faith, and they require an experimental faith, which has learned, not from the reports of others, but from its own experience, that it is best to rely solely on God and His Word, which has experienced doubts and temptations, and has been confirmed and approved by those experiments. Faith never tested is hardly true, but beware here of faith that never doubts, and faith that always doubts. That is for those who are secure, this for those who are negligent, and those who are subsisting on the path of sanctification. Faith is weak, I confess, but let it not always remain weak, let it be erected, let it be established at last, Christ must stand in this court. Lord, increase faith in us. Thus the eye of faith is enlightened in us, thus the previously unstable mind is at last strengthened, so that we are no longer compelled to be tossed and turned by the various winds and waves of doctrine. Matthew. Can the foot of faith be established in this way, so that it may stand stronger against the flesh, and walk more readily in the Spirit? Paul? Why not? Consider that Ephesians 3. 16. 18 where Paul wishes to be given to the Ephesians, by virtue of being corroborated by his Spirit in the inner man, Christ to be corroborated by the power of his Spirit in the inner man, he has Christ through faith in your hearts. 4.18. Rooted and founded in charity. Note here, 1, to be corroborated by virtue. In hypocrites outside the temple there is no virtue, but at least an external mask, in the servants of the first court there is virtue, true and living faith. In the adolescence of the second court there is the strength of virtue, the stronger strength of the inner man, or of faith, and of all spiritual gifts. 2. To dwell in Christ. Paul says that Christ is formed in the sons or apprentices, to live here in our own country. There let Christ draw his abode, here he builds more fully, in the third or innermost court he adorns himself with his virtues. Outside the temple dwells not Christ, but his mask. In the temple and its court first Christ dwells with true grace, he dwells in the second court with greater grace. In that his virtues are outlined, in this more fully described. There is a desire for the virtues of Christ. Here is a certain possession of the virtues of Christ. There I would, here to be able in a certain way. Their wishes, oh that I could so, as I would. Of these it is, oh that I could do better and more correctly. In the first instance, the inner man is a baby and wants to, but is not yet able to walk, he also tries, and learns to walk with the help of supports, in the second, he not only wants to, but is also able to walk, and learns to walk straighter. In the third he can readily walk, or walk about. For Christ, in dwelling with greater grace, strengthens him who walks and supports him who stumbles, so that he can stand against the threats and allurements of the world, by which the mind of recruits is often cast down and hindered in its course. For Christ stands in this court, he stands with his head erect, not only as a vigorous fighter, but also as a strong conqueror. They win. Matthew. Do you think that lust can be overcome? Paul? Consider that of John. 1. John 2. 14. I have written to you, adolescents, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. He says 3, 1. Young people know that they are strong, they are stronger children. 2. That the word of God should remain in them, 
which was still fluctuating in infants, the memory of those in whom they carry Christ is stable, but that of infants is unstable. 3. That the evil one overcame them, I, e, the devil. The devil attacks our soul through worldly external objects, worldly things insinuate themselves into our soul through the senses and their concupiscences, for these are like snares or buckles, by which our soul is bound to the world. Whoever, therefore, can see through these snares, even if they are subtle at times, and break them with an easy task, and keep his soul immaculate from earthly things, he has conquered the devil, the prince of the world, and conquered the world. Faith is the victory by which we overcome the world. For faith does not allow the soul to cling to such vain and perishable things in the world, and whenever the appetite wants to reattach it with its clasps or disordered movements, it strongly breaks it off, and draws the soul back to spiritual things. Young people in Christ can do this, because the word of God remains in them, because they are strong. To conquer lusts. Matthew. But how can we overcome, when the impure source of lust remains in the flesh, as long as we carry it around, as long as we live here? Paul. Covetousness is overcome, not so that it does not exist, not so that it no longer rises and fights, but so that it does not prevail, as before, against the spirit. They are tamed, not taken away. By apprentices with difficulty and with pain, by youths more easily and with toil, by adults very easily and with joy, concupiscence is conquered and controlled. The fountain of concupiscence may be blocked up, so that it scarcely drips drop by drop, when it formerly flowed freely, and the heart becomes polluted. Otherwise, how will God create a clean heart in you, unless you want to block this impure fountain? And although he has been carefully obstructed, yet he always seeks to break new cracks, and very easily pollutes with his impure drops the clear water springing from the fountain of the Spirit. What will it not do, if you allow it to flow in its old fashion? Believe me, a pure heart will never be found who has not conquered and tamed his sensuality. Matthew. You said earlier that the virtues of Christ were outlined in the mind of the recruits, they were more fully depicted in the mind of the youth, how do you understand that? Virtues succeed the expelled vices. Paul? Where Christ is truly present, there his virtues are also present, for it is known from them. In the disciples Christ was drawn by faith, as Paul says, therefore Christ's virtues are present against our vices. That is to say, his temperance against our intemperance, his chastity against our lusts, his acquiescence against our vain and wandering desires, his love and kindness against our moroseness, his meekness against our fierce anger, his patience against our impatience, his humility against our pride, etc. The Holy Spirit impresses this image of Christ on our hearts through pious meditations. For the aforementioned virtues are the fruits and signs of the indwelling Spirit. But when this image of Christ is first impressed, as the sun rising, he points out in the heart the darkness of our vices, and tries to drive them away, whence the struggle in the servants, then, as the sun rising higher, he suppresses them with strength, and supplies the place of darkness with light. Finally, like the sun in the noonday light, it occupies the whole mind, pervades it, adorns it, so that the virtues from all sides shine brightly in words and deeds, which occurs in adults. The second thing happens to our adolescents, who suppress gluttonous, lustful, wandering, angry, bitter, ambitious, and other such vices more easily than recruits, and not only suppress them, but also begin to substitute good thoughts and desires, and holy affections. For when vices are rooted out, virtues succeed. And this is because Christ no longer lies or totters in their hearts, like a tender child, but stands like a robust youth. Chapter 2. Of the Happiness of Hearts. Matthew. Blessed, whom thou hast chosen and assumed, he will dwell in your courts, says Psalms. Psalm 65. 4. Because our young people have been taken closer to Christ, and those who live in the inner court, perhaps they will be happier with children. Greater trust. Paul. Thus the altars stand nearer, when he is sacrificed, therefore they have greater confidence and faith towards Christ, 1 John 3.19, 20, 21. By this we know that we are of the truth, and before him we will persuade our hearts. For if our heart reproves us because God is faithful in our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have trust towards God. Children believe, 
but they do not know that they believe, the young believe, and, when they know, they know that they believe, the heart, on the other hand, knows and condemns them, that is to say, that they do not know the truth, because they are still carried away to sins through imprudence and impotence. Hence it is with difficulty in temptations that they convince themselves that they really believe. They need, therefore, guides who will raise up, who will call back to memory Christ who was rescued through temptations, perhaps in these words which Saint John uses. Elsewhere, my son, I have written these things to you, that you may not sin. But if by chance you have sinned, taken away by the onslaught of the flesh, think that you have a paraclete with the Father, Jesus Christ, the just, etc. Believe him? And even though you do not know how to believe yourself, God still knows, for God is greater than your heart, he knows everything, and this very thing, which you truly believe, will also be shown to you in due time. Know this in the meantime, when your heart condemns you, because of your sins, then God will absolve you. For whoever humbles himself, God exalts him, and whoever exalts and acquits himself, God condemns him. Etc. With these and other words, the heart that criticizes the infants is hardly persuaded. Major charity. But in these young men of ours there is a heart that does not criticize, because they no longer slip so often from imprudence and weakness, if they know. Let them make proper use of the gifts of greater grace, and watch more diligently against sins, and resist them more strongly. But if it happens that they stumble or slip, they are able to raise themselves up, and by reproving their hearts they are more easily persuaded before God, whence they have a greater faith than children. For if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence in God. Matthew. But are they not happier in this one thing at least, that they stand nearer to the altar, and have greater confidence? Paul. Nay, when the sacrifices are burnt, they are more heated by the divine fire, which consumes all the sacrifices, which for this reason God had ordered to be kept constantly in the temple. Matthew. I don't understand, what do you want? Paul. I want this. Like the victims who were slaughtered in the first court, when they were burned in the second court, in this way the concupiscences which have been slain there, must here be burned up by the fire of divine love, so that the heart may be thoroughly purified from them. On the other hand, if the throats remain in the mind, they either immediately revive or drive away Christ with their stench, which is very dangerous. Supposedly, therefore, they are to be consumed by the divine fire of love, so that the heart may become pure. God is a consuming fire, unless you suffer him to consume the perversions of your soul with the fire of his love, he will once consume your soul with the fire of his fury. Matthew. I don't understand your mind yet. Paul. That's it again. Christ is a shining and burning light. Therefore, because in this court he assumes our soul more closely, it warms more with the ardor of charity. Charity is greater here than among recruits. Matthew. But where do you prove this? Paul. Consider what we quoted earlier from Ephesians 3. 17. Strengthened and founded in charity, namely, when the inner man is strengthened in virtue, when Christ begins to dwell more closely in the heart, then we begin to become rooted in charity, we shall indeed be founded in the third court. The mind of children is rebuked by the love of Christ, the young mind is rooted in the love of Christ, it is planted there, here the charity takes root, that we love Christ, or rather we are loved by him, and for the sake of the neighbor Christ, they grow in the recognition of truth and hatred of sin, these in confirmation, and with the love of justice, they are urged by hatred to suppress sin, they love to exercise justice. But having been freed from sin, you have become slaves of righteousness. Romans 6. 18. The mind cannot serve justice unless it is freed from the dominion of sin. They live in the spirit of charity, these begin to walk in the same, and do in part what they want to do and try to do, there is therefore a greater charity for us, whence they proclaim the works of charity. But there is greater peace of mind. Major tranquility. Matthew. Where did this come from? Paul. Consider the word cross, fixed, Galatians. 5. 24. They fasten the recruits of the appetite to the cross. They often slip away from them, to be again seized and seized, hence the more frequent crowds in the mind. With these they only rarely break away, but they are more easily caught again, 
and can be held more strongly under the command of the reborn will, and hence greater tranquility. In the court this second, as if in the retreat of the inner heart, greater silence, rarer noises. Consider also that you have won that which d. John. Says of the youths, 1 John. 2. 13. A fuller victory is followed by a fuller peace. The children also have the peace of Christ, when their appetites, having strongly resisted, have exhausted them. But because the forces of the enemy were not so worn out, just as in the second court, where Christ is stronger, they cannot have so much peace as the youths. There the peace of Christ's heart is more easily delivered, it is more difficult to restore, here he is more violently troubled, and the mind is more easily composed, if however, there is labor and watchful guardianship, otherwise, peace can be completely lost here. For peace guards the mind, but it is guarded both by labor and diligence in the good works of our vocation, and by vigilance and attention in prayers for taking away evils and contributing and increasing good things. Greater Attention to Prayers Matthew. Perhaps you think that there is also a greater attention to the prayers here. Paul? I think so. Where there is greater confidence in believing, there and praying. Whence St. John, he says, 1 John. 3. 22. Trust in God, and if we lose anything, we receive it from Him. 8. 5. 14. 15. Where the force of the fire is greater, there the incense is more frequent and thick, the prayers of the saints are incensed. Revelation. 8. 3. Persevere in prayers, watching over them in thanksgiving. It is more important to continue to watch than simply to pray. Children are prayed for, young people pay attention and watch in prayers, adults can continue all night in prayer, as we read that the Saviour did several times. Outside the temple, prayers are at least on the lips, in the temple it is true in the heart, and they are done in spirit and truth. But those who begin in the temple, at least begin also in prayers often intervening with the flesh and easily disturbing the devotion. Those who are advanced not only begin, but continue for some time in prayer, and more easily restore their interrupted devotion. They want at least to pray devoutly, these can already pray for something, and they wish for greater strength in the spirit of the kingdom. They are forced to use at least sighs or hurling prayers because of the onslaught of the flesh. They can use more intense prayers if they want to stay awake during prayers. When, therefore, our people can have greater confidence, charity, tranquility, and devotion in this second court, who will not pronounce them happier. There are many things that make them happy, but these are enough. It is better to experience this happiness in the heart than to list it at length. Chapter 3. Of their defects, hindrances, and dangers. Spirit Pollution. Paul. Although ours excelled in this court, in many things, however, they still fail, and if they do not want to stop here and continue further, they will not only be brought back to their previous ignorance and impotence, but they can also completely fall away, and regurgitate the filth of sin. Matthew. Where did this come from? Paul? Because all the pollution has not yet escaped. They have indeed expelled the contamination of the flesh, but not yet the contamination of the spirit, which is as subtle as it is more dangerous, that God gave greater grace, so with greater diligence and skill he wished to drive him out. Matthew. But what is this contamination? Paul? The spirit is reason, for what else is the soul than the rational spirit, on which God once impressed his image, now, alas, lost, but restored by grace. Defilements of the spirit can therefore be defects, which arise in reason free from lusts and placed on the royal throne, before the sanctification it is accomplished. And unless they are corrected, they are more dangerous. Matthew. Why? Paul? The vices of kings are more injurious than those of subjects. Reason is the king, governed by the Holy Spirit and governing the inner appetite and the whole state of the body. Now, if the king abandons his king here, if he refused to follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit, what vices, what dangers are not to be feared. For we know that reason, left to itself, is more subtle and more pernicious at work in spiritual or divine things, and when he rejects the humble and plain leadership of the Holy Spirit, he accepts the proud and crooked leadership of the spirit of darkness. Hence the spiritual malignities in the heavens, against which we, as the Apostle testifies, must fight. 
These spiritual evils arise finally from these pollutions of reason, or failures, when we do not want to continue further in sanctification. For as the sky rejoices in perpetual motion, so the soul, if it does not advance, it goes back, it does not remain in the same state for long. If it does not always progress for the better, it fails for the worse. And he who was able to excel in good, when he stops and regresses, excels in evil. It is therefore dangerous to stay here. Matthew. But where does this danger come from, when reason is already enlightened, and by the grace of the Holy Spirit it has learned to tame the appetite? The wandering about of fantasy. Paul. There is indeed a light with the powers of grace against the viciousness of the lower appetite, but not yet against the confusion of the higher, which is usually given in the third court, therefore, he must be tended to. First of all, here arises the danger from imagination, which uses reason as a servant in knowing and judging things. But there is a perfidious maid who sometimes favors the sensitive appetite more, and tries to blind reason with false opinions. Moreover, he is wandering, restless, inconstant, eager for novelty, chattering, often filling his mind with many nonsense and fables. Unless, therefore, the license and wandering of this servant is restrained by tame sensuality, the whole kingdom of the mind, already in some way repaired, can easily be disturbed and overthrown. It will not be unknown to an expert in human affairs that whole houses and whole empires have been disturbed and overthrown by the vices and chattering tongue of one servant or servant. Imagination is therefore to be checked, so that, occupied with thoughts about the necessary and useful, he does not run away to superfluous and idle things, but allows himself to be restrained under the control of prudence or judgment of discretion. Those who are engaged in this state experience how difficult it is. The course in good works is equal. Matthew. I should like to hear how it is escaped, and what dangers are to be feared from it. Paul. That being said, it is extremely laborious, when the moment he can bring himself more quickly under and diffuse himself in various ways. But just as a wanderer is always new, rarely true and useful, thus fantasy diffused into various kinds of things rarely useful, usually futile. However, I will give a few examples of this wandering, in those gifts of grace of which we have spoken before, so that you can infer the rest from here. Matthew. We said that our people in this court should have a firmer recognition of the truth and a greater confidence in Christ. Paul rightly admonishes, about this the imagination wanders, one, out of curiosity, knowing more in spiritual things than it can take for its own state. Matthew. But I think that curiosity is the vice of those who, standing outside the temple in the towers, only knowing themselves, without experience, feed on sacred things. Paul Curiosity is given outside the temple, or the sacred scriptures, in purely human and natural things, and he is of those who boast of knowing the hidden things of nature. Curiosity is given about the temple, and it is of those who desire to know about things not necessary for salvation, which are written on them. Curiosity is also given in the temple in the study of sanctity, when, of course, the mind does not want to ascend by a step, but wants to fly prematurely to higher heights, or to break into the sanctuary of God before the time. How dangerous it is, it can be learned from the examples of the Israelites at Mount Sinai, whom God commands to be kept away, lest they break out to see the Lord and perish, and of the Bethsmites, who opened the ark with irreverent curiosity, and because of that they perished in a sudden defeat. If this deviation is not resisted, confidence easily degenerates into reckless confidence, which takes away all filial reverence and respect for divine holiness and majesty. And this is contrary to the admonitions of the apostles who commanded us to continue sanctification in the fear of God, to work salvation with fear and trembling, to serve God with modesty and reverence, Hebrews. 12. 28. In the fear of the uninhabited in your time to behave. 1 Peter. 1. 17. The excessive confidence of children becomes obstinate, displeasing to their parents. 2. By escaping from this to the higher prisons, he easily wanders to the lower ones, and there, having been left in the filth of the world for a longer time, he returns polluted, polluting the mind or unwillingly. Just as Dinah had come out of the tabernacle of Jacob's father, and was curious to see the daughters of that place, whether they were equal to her in beauty, she lost her virginity, even though she was unwilling. Genesis? 
34. 1. In this way, imagination towards others, either inside or outside the temple, whom it thinks inferior, going forth with its thoughts, and comparing their state with its own, easily corrupts the purity of the soul, and fills it, even when it is reluctant, with the vain swelling of its own love. Knowledge, especially when it, in the act of reflection, knows itself, is easily inflated. 1. Corinthians? 8. 1. We must, and we can, check this noxious license of wandering fantasy, though with difficulty, and we can, if we wish to watch diligently against ourselves and use the grace given to us properly. Matthew. You also said that ours here have a greater charity for doing empty works, or for fulfilling the law, for charity is the fulfillment of the law, Romans. 12. 10. Does not imagination wander dangerously here? Paul? In all four, feeling that his strength is conceded, he snatches his mind from the right hand to excessive presumption, so that the mind pleasing to himself, looking down on others as weak, and relying on his own strength, attacks the greater, and thus impinges and slips. For this easily happens to those who are firm and strong in faith and charity, so that they please themselves and despise the infirmities of others, contrary to the admonition of the Apostle, Romans. 14. 1. Imagination, repressed by too much shame on the right, easily snatches the mind from the left to lethargy and torpor. Matthew. It is read that Claudius, healed by Peter and John, walked in the temple and danced or leapt for joy, that he could walk again. Paul? You suggest these things in good time, thus our young men take too much pleasure in being granted strength to walk, which infants have not yet possessed, they walk unevenly, they only dance, they barely crawl, soon they run too hastily, thinking that they can, which they cannot yet, they soon fall and rise, and walk very carelessly. Although they do not exceed the walking path, they still exceed the mode of walking. Affections cleansed from their vices, indeed ordered, that is to say, to a legitimate object, namely, the operation of justice, but they have not yet been moderated, while here they are too hasty, there they are too slow in executing a good purpose, it is like a ship driven by the wind, only more violently, only more sluggishly tossed. This deficiency must also be corrected, so that the Saviour can truly speak of us. Canticles? 7. 1. How beautiful are your steps in your shoes, daughter of the Prince, or daughter of Spontaneous. Whether we are to observe what here, and what is spontaneous, and what is beautiful or decent, we must walk properly in the ways of the Lord and obey ourselves. Matthew. But what harm does that kind of unevenness in walking? Paul? Unless it is corrected, it hinders and overturns our whole course on the rails of piety, so that we may by no means attain the prize. How dangerous it is, the Apostle warns, saying, So run, that you may receive. Chapter 4. On Other Obstacles and Dangers. Excessive Anxiety About the Future. Paul? I have not yet enumerated all the wanderings about the study of the good works of the imagination. Matthew. What then remains? Paul? There are many things, but I will add only this, that when we diligently try to do what our job requires, we often run away with unnecessary concern for the future. Matthew. How do you understand that, Paul? We ought at least to direct our thoughts to the work at hand, whether it is really good before God, whether we also do this well and sat rightly according to the norm of the divine word etc. But imagination here extends the thoughts to the future reward of the work, to the judgment of men about it. Thus the minister does not often think about the word of the sermon, whether he is speaking correctly, as it is fitting before God, but what men are to judge of the sermon, etc. Matthew. But what is the harm of these thoughts? Paul? Very much, for in this way the mind is filled either with vain hope and desire for praise, or with vain fear of human contempt, and the right intention is corrupted, which commands in all things to look only to God, not to men, and thus it is easy to slip into hypocrisy. Here, therefore, the license of thought is to be punished, so that our thoughts may remain in their circle, fixed on present things. You take care of the present, entrust the future to the Lord. Dangers concerning tranquility of mind. Matthew. Nor will it be permitted to digress to the past. Paul. It is true, 
but in such a way that we examine our works and correct the detected aberrations. For there always remains to be corrected in our works, which we notice better after we have done them than when we do them. Thus it is permissible for ours to return to the court first, and to examine the manifold defects concerning the struggle and hatred of sin, from there they will return more prudent towards themselves and more pleasing to God, but it is not allowed to hasten to the inner court. For the mind, being too anxious about the future, or vain desires, or vain fears, disturbs itself, and deprives itself of its tranquility. Let each one walk as he is called. Matthew. Can't imagination wander dangerously around tranquility. Paul. Why not? For in the way he disturbs his mind with too premature desires for success, in the way he pleases himself too much in his state, he slips from true tranquility to dangerous security and negligence. Indeed, we must always desire an increase in piety, but in such a way as to leave it to the divine will, whenever he sees fit to advance us to greater heights. In the meantime let us attend to reading, meditation, and all the works of our calling. We must sometimes also with a grateful mind recall the grace given to us, and be content with it, give thanks and be humble before God, thinking, I am inferior, O Lord, to all your mercies. I gladly prefer to be the least among your saints, if only you have granted me a place in your most holy association of grace and glory, etc. But we must be careful, lest this acquiescence degenerate into laziness, and apathy. As God does not give earthly gifts because of labor, but not without labor, so he gives spiritual gifts gratuitously, but not to the idle, but to the diligent, not to those who despair, but to those who ask and hope, not to those who remain, but to those who continue in sanctification. It is very dangerous to stay, if you have said, it is enough, you have perished the timid ones, who hide behind the labors and troubles in the work of sanctification, and despair of growth, a part of them will be in the lake burning with fire and brimstone. Revelation 12. 8. Evasion about prayers. Matthew. Therefore and here imagination must be restrained, but what do you say about prayers, which imagination often interrupts with various strange thoughts? Paul? I think this is the most important thing to watch out for. For it can scarcely be described, how much license he escapes here, how variously, how easily he distracts the mind, and renders him utterly unfit for prayer. Matthew. But what does it hurt? As long as we gather ourselves together in prayers, God easily forgives these infirmities for Christ's sake. Paul? No, it hurts the most. Do you think it pleases God that we turn our minds away from him while praying, then turn back, and turn away again? Doesn't it hurt to displease God? And what is more dangerous than to make this fluff, to see its spots and not want to wipe them off? Is it not so that a window is opened to the contempt of God, when we do not want to correct the recognized weaknesses? Indeed, our Lord wants to tolerate them, but for a while, not forever. That is why he wants to lead further in sanctification, so that he may have a church that has not the least spot, or wrinkle, or anything of the sort, but that it should be holy and immaculate. Ephesians. 5. 27. Unless you wish to be sanctified here, you will not be able to be glorified there, here all the stains of sin are to be washed away, for nothing impure will enter the heavenly Jerusalem. Notably, the Saviour said to Peter, Unless I wash you, you have no part in me. Matthew. But how will you avoid strange thoughts while praying? Paul. Vigilance. Hear the Saviour, watch and pray. You cannot pray unless you are willing to watch and pay close attention to your heart. Matthew. It has not yet been given to me. Paul. Therefore ask and it shall be given to you, from him, from whom all the divine power given to life and piety proceed, too. Peter. 1. 3. 5. He is more ready to give than you are to receive. You will lack nothing, provided you are willing to use all diligence in this. Chapter 5. On the supports to proceed. Matthew. In this court dwelt the Levites, so called from joining or boring, because they were attached to the priests in the sacred ministry, and had to adhere to them. Paul? Thus let our youths join themselves to the more adulterous, who dwell in the innermost court, and who descend yonder to inform the people, let them join themselves in teaching, and adhere constantly to Christ, 
and his doctrines, if they wish to continue and advance. That care, be in these, that your progress may be manifest in all. 1 Timothy. 4. 15. Thus Timothy was adjunct to Paul, and with him he taught the Gentiles, wherefore he was exceedingly successful, so much so that Paul himself at last placed himself beside, as is clear from the epistle to the Philippians. Philippians? 1. 1. He who converses daily with the saints can become holier. Matthew. It was for the Levites to minister to the priests, and to inform the people. Paul? Thus should our people behave with the more perfect and imperfect. That they may learn from them, to teach them, he will take away his love. He who sees and recognizes others as more perfect easily thinks himself perfect, this will remove negligence. He who teaches learns. Fraternal warning. Matthew. But this was indeed established in the Old Testament, but in New Testament we have another constitution, namely, that God will inscribe his law on our hearts, so that there is no need for anyone to teach his neighbor, or to say to his brother, Know the Lord. For it will be that all, both small and great, may come to know God. Paul? Well, and this is because God once inscribed his law on tablets of stone, from which it had to be inculcated in the hearts of the teachers and students with great and tireless diligence, and hardly at last did it stick successfully enough. It is laborious to carve something out of stone, but already under the New Testament he wants to implant his law in hearts through the Holy Spirit, and having taken away by the teaching of the law a hard heart, or which he had tolerated among the Jews, he wants to give a carnal or soft heart, to whom the evangelical doctrine can be easily impressed by the right of Holy Spirit. For all who truly believe receive the Holy Spirit, who breaks the stony heart and prepares it so that it can imbibe the heavenly teachings, and what is said and heard outwardly, the Holy Spirit seals inwardly in the heart through a living experience of faith. So that we should be more concerned about the preservation of the law inscribed by the Holy Spirit than about the same inscription. Whence St. John says, 1 John. 2. 27. You do not need someone to teach you, but just as his anointing teaches you about everything, and it is true, and it is not a lie, and just as he taught you, abide in him. Of course, Christians are not so much to teach as to warn, when St. Peter says, 2. Peter. 1. 12. I will not cease always to remind you of these things, and indeed knowing and confirmed in the present truth. But I think it just, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to raise you up in admonition. The law requires a doctrine to be written in the hearts, such as in the New Testament. It was perpetual, whence the Old Testament was pedagogy to the New Testament. But after at this point in the catechumens' pedagogy, the law is already inscribed and implanted in the hearts by the Holy Spirit, it requires not so much learning as patience. For the faith of a lightly strummed lyre resounds, thus the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit is awakened and raised by the admonition of them, or by a slight touch. The faith of the New Testament rejects the proud brow of the doctor, admits the counsel of a friend and humble counsel, because it acknowledges no higher teacher than the Holy Spirit in his word, to whom he freely obeys. Matthew. But what follows from this? Paul? This follows from the fact that in the New Testament the word of God must not only be perceived by the ears, not only by the thoughts that sometimes roll over, but must be deeply inscribed in the heart, that is, through frequent meditations. And when this happens, Christians are sure of the Holy Spirit assisting and sealing them, and they are rendered so ready and expedient, that they themselves and the divine word can recognize and worship God, and do not always need a teacher, but first a guide, henceforth monitor, that the law may be inscribed in the hearts, or that faith may be preserved and increased. And from this you see how our Levites ought to behave with those who are within, that is, with the inferiors, as guides and catechists, with equals as monitors and friends, with superiors as disciples. Matthew. Can they not go out to those who are outside, namely with this counsel, to convert them, and bring them into the temple with them? Paul? They can, but rarely do it on their own. Matthew. Why? Paul? I would certainly not recommend it to children, because they are easily carried away by the flattery and persuasion of the world and they themselves are perverted more quickly than they can convert others. The sacred do not so quickly sanctify the profane, 
as the profane pollute the sacred, but the adults already strengthened against the pollutions of the world, will often go out to the temple, with the urgent love of Christ, and will try the conversion of others by teaching and admonishing them. Matthew. But is it necessary to warn others? Is it enough to worry about ourselves? Paul? It is enough for children, who for that reason enter the temple and dwell in the first court, that they learn to be anxious about their own safety, abstracted from the vain solicitude of the welfare of others. But it is not enough for adolescents and adults to be certain of their safety, but it is necessary for them to seek the salvation of others also, it is beneficial for them. Necessary because of the apostolic admonitions of Philippians. 2. 4. Not what are their own, each considering, but also what are the things of others. 1 Thessalonians. 5. 2. Comfort one another and be united in him. Etc. It is necessary to exercise charity, which commands us to seek what are of Christ. And how do you say that Jesus loves you? If you do not want to feed his lambs and sheep, John 21. 15, 16, 17. If you are not brought, do you seek to bring others to Jesus, following the example of Andrew and Peter? John 1. 40, 41. Matthew. But what if they reject the warnings? Paul? Those who are inside will not reject warnings. For this is the communication of Colossians. 2. 19. Ephesians. 4. 16. The spiritual members of Christ, that they may willingly suggest one another's admonitions, willingly receive them. Of those who are outside, it is not immediately necessary to despair, even if they reject once, they are to be tempted again and again, or to be taught with meekness and prudence, whether perhaps God wants to give repentance to the recognition of the truth. Etc. 2 Timothy. 2. 25. It is appropriate for those who are for as, information, those who are inside, indeed, admonition. Matthew. But what is the use of wishing to inform those who reject all information and are already wise to themselves, or what is the use of warning those who already know, or can they know by the guidance of the Holy Spirit and the Scriptures? Here our labor is futile, he is superfluous, can't we, therefore, stay with him, especially when he wins us a bad reputation in the world, that is, through arrogance and ambition. Paul? We cannot sit back because God has commanded, God's commandments are not to be neglected because of the contradicting world, they cannot be the servants of Christ, Galatians. 1. 10. And although our admonition does not profit others, but it is good for us. It is therefore useful for our young people to sometimes wish to inform those who are outside, so that they may learn to teach wisely and calmly, and to bear the contradictions of others patiently. Thus they will grow in the prudence, meekness, and patience of Christ. It is useful for those who are within to want to warn, if they are successful in their vigilance, and while they want to arouse others, they will arouse themselves. Chapter 6. Of Other Supporters. Diligence or Industrious Charity. Matthew. What else should be considered in the ministry of the Levites? Paul. Diligence. So let our adolescents be diligent, prompt and ready to serve others, thus they will grow in charity. Our Saviour was so diligent in teaching, so ready to do good, that he sometimes neglected food, drink, rest, and other necessities of the body, so that people thought that he himself could not endure these labors for long, nor could he remain sane. John 4. 31, and Mark 6. 31, 3. 20, 21. Let us imitate diligence itself, not circumstances. Matthew. But the body must be given its honor to the fullness of Colossians. 2. 23 lest he should be exhausted by excessive labors. Paul? That's right, the body should be indulged, but not served. Both extremes must be taken care of, that you neither indulge too much, nor deprive the body too much. But there is not so much danger from this as from that, for you will rarely see in these times those who make their bodies too fat for piety. You will see more in the care of the body and the study of their own comfort. Matthew what does this harm? Paul? It hinders growth especially in charity. For as long as you are too interested in your own interests, 
charity and readiness to serve others perish. Whatever you do, at least in passing, do it with death and honor, while all our things should be done in charity and indeed industrious. 1. Corinthians 16. 14. 1. Thessalonians 1. 3. The more laborious charity is, the more ready it is, and the more ready it is, the more acceptable it is. Matthew. Yes, I would gladly serve at any time, provided I knew that my services would be welcome. Paul. And here the curiosity of the imagination is to be punished. As regards thinking, whether the things which we are about to do according to the precepts of God will be pleasing or displeasing to men, when we believe that we serve not men, but God, when we desire to please not men but Christ. Therefore, both the love of one's own self, seeking advantage, and the inclination to please men, looking for human praise, must be eliminated, because it hinders, it pollutes charity, and we must wait for the praise which Christ reserves in the heavens, and will once upon a time give on the last day. It is well to please the Lord to honor the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5 9 there is one ambition in the children of the world, another in the children of God. Vigilance. To him the honor of the world, they seek human praise as the highest good with the greatest earnestness, these seek with the utmost earnestness the praise which is stored up with Christ in heaven. Let us therefore strive to serve men, but to please Christ, not men. Let us strive in humility, ready to be deprived of all praise and consolation for Christ's sake, let us study diligently, not at least our own, but what our neighbors are looking at. Thus let us prosper in charity, for as apprentices should grow in knowledge, so youths should grow in charity. Matthew. We also read of the Levites that they were the watchmen, and guardians of the temple. Paul. Their vigilance was, first, to shut the gates. Matthew. Whether or not, will you say the same about us? Paul. Certainly. We close our doors when we properly observe the external senses, and abstain from all the pleasures of the flesh and the temptations of the world. The eyes must be averted, that they may not see, turning away their ears, lest they hear vanity. Matthew. Why so? Is it forbidden to admit lawful recreations and goodness? Paul. All things are permitted, but not all things are permitted. Unless the eyes and ears, which are the principal gates of the soul, are carefully guarded, the mind will easily be polluted, and temperance and vigilance will be endangered. Matthew. Where can you find such abstainers? Paul. Can it be that you have read Rechabites, who refused to drink the wine offered by Jeremiah in the temple, Jeremiah. 35. 6. Is not that praised by God? Therefore those who wish to live in the temple and continue in the pursuit of sanctity rightly abstain from wine and even lawful pleasures. Refer here to the fact that God forbade the priests to enter the temple with wine and fear. Of course God displeases and hinders sanctification the excessive use of carnal pleasures, even if you know how to use them in moderation. Who would not spurn the sordid pleasures of the body, when God has reserved better ones in the temple of the soul tending to holiness? Matthew. What avails such sobriety? Paul? It promotes much needed supervision for our adolescents. Be sober, watchful. He who does not want to be sober cannot stay awake. 1 Peter? 5. 8. Matthew. What else do you require for the supervision of the Levites? Paul? It was theirs not only to close and open the gates, but also to recognize those who entered and to ward off the profane. Matthew. What is this? Paul. Thus let our people watch over the thoughts that arise in their hearts, and learn not only good from evil, but also the useful and necessary from the frivolous and unnecessary, to retain and cherish the holy, to ward off and expel the profane. Matthew. What will this do? Paul. Thus they will receive the attitude of Hebrews. 5. 14 and by means of the senses trained to the discrimination of good and evil, which is perfect or mature. Matthew. But what harm does it do to indulge in vain and superfluous thoughts? Paul. Whether, or not, you have read, 2 Chronicles. 23. 13. Of Athaliah entering the temple in a frenzy, and trying to stir up a rebellion, what would she have done, 
had not Jehoiada the pontiff, by a prudent plan, taken care to have her thrown out of the temple and killed. Thus vain thoughts can easily bring back the barely tamed tyranny of concupiscence, stir up sedition, and overthrow the kingdom of God, which has been well begun in the mind, unless we are willing to watch against them and drive them out of the mind. Therefore we must be vigilant, so that we carefully guard both the external senses through abstinence and the internal through continence. And thus at last, blessing God, to continue in sanctification, and through the gate with fervent prayers, beaten with longings and sighs, opened by God's mercy and kindness, we shall be able to ascend to the innermost court, and dwell there. The Vow Thou verily, most excellent Saviour, increase and strengthen in this second court the strength of faith and charity, support and direct our steps in the paths of justice, so that we may not deviate to the right hand, nor to the left hand by pusillanimity, but may proceed straightly in diligence and vigilance. Supply the lack of faith, add to and increase our love for each other and for everyone, keep our hearts firm without sin in holiness, before God and our Father, finish all the pleasing goodness and work of faith in virtue that your name may be glorified. Amen. Part 4. Those who are in the third court or who are more mature in Christ. Chapter 1. Of their state in general. It is a court, good, holy and admirable. Matthew. We are filled with the goods of your house, your temple is holy, amazing in its justice. Psalm 65. 5, 6. Perhaps this is not wrongly applied to this inner court. Paul. So it is. Here the splendor of the holy temple was most conspicuous. Here were seen the bronze altar, the bronze columns, the sea above the bronze oxen, the bronze goats, and other things worthy of admiration. The mind thus led is filled with spiritual goods, goods, I say, of grace, what he longed for in the first court, to what he tended in the second court. Here is good, here is holy, here is an admirable temple. Matthew. How good! Paul? Because God here fills the soul with his goods, as much as, as if to say, he can catch in this weakness. In the first court the soul tasted the drops of divine anointing and was raised up. In the second court he felt the rivulets, and was strengthened. In this court the whole river of goodness is filled. Psalms 36. 9. They will get drunk with the fat of your house and you will drink them from the torrent of pleasure. Matthew. How holy! Paul? Here the mind is cleansed from all pollution of flesh and spirit. All the cleansing of the Old Testament was done by water and fire. Matthew. And now they were found in the temple, especially in this court. For there was always water in the sea of wine and other vessels, to wash away the dirt. A sacred fire was kept for burning sacrifices. Paul? Thus here is always present the water of daily penance to wash away the defilements of the flesh, and the fire of charity to burn away the defilements of the spirit. Matthew. But in what order does this purification take place? Paul? It is preceded by the baptism of John, who baptized with water and the spirit, followed by the baptism of Christ, who baptized with fire and the spirit. Thicker water washed away the coarser filth of concupiscence in the first court, then a finer fire followed, burning the finer defilements of the spirit in the second court. Matthew. Is it not enough that the soul is pure, cleansed from lust or vicious affections? Paul? Not yet. Stronger fire cleanses water, consider Elijah's sacrifice on Mount Carmel. It was first doused with water very copiously, so that, if any impurity still adhered to the victim, it could easily be washed away. Then the divine fire approaching not only the prepared victim, but he devoured the water itself, so that not a drop of it was left in the trenches around the altar. Thus penitence, like water, washes away the contamination of the flesh, but charity, like fire, burns up the contamination of the spirit, and purifies the mind more powerfully. Water quenches the fire of ungodly lusts, but the divine fire of charity again consumes water. And thus the purified soul can enter the sanctuary. We pass through fire and water, and you bring us into refreshment. He entered your house. We pass through water in the first court, through fire in the second court. We are led into the third court. And then finally it follows, I will enter your house. Thus the temple is holy. Greater freedom of the Spirit. Matthew. But how wonderful! 
Paul? Because everything here is wonderful, and the Lord marvels at the saints brought here, he equips them with wonderful and excellent gifts, so that others who observe their lives may be admired, or he miraculously preserves them in the world, so that they may say. Psalms 17. 7. Many miracles have been done, and you are my strong helper. Matthew. But why is it called an admirable temple in justice? Paul? Because everything here is arranged in just order, and is lawfully done according to order and propriety. In the recruits the disordered mind begins to be well settled. It is composed in the advanced. As an adult, he is already well composed and brought into order, so that he can do good things well, just and justly. And in order that all this may be lawfully done, they say that Solomon enlarged this court, and made a wider area than was in the tabernacle. Matthew. What is this? Paul? It may indicate that under the New Testament we have a greater freedom of the spirits than under the Old Testament. For they were tightly shut up by the bars of the law and timidly served God, but we can serve God with a freer spirit. The more holy the mind, the freer the obedience. Matthew. Whence this? Paul? Consider that of Paul, Romans 8. 15. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery again for fear, but you received the spirit of adoption. Compare also that, to Timothy. 1. 7. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and love and modesty. There is fear in slavery. In adoption there is love. Fear narrows, love expands the heart. We can therefore under the New Testament, to serve God with a spirit of adoption and love, with an enlarged heart, and thus with a freer spirit. Matthew. Perfect love indeed casts out fear, but without fear it easily degenerates into boldness and excessive and reckless confidence, which displeases God. Prudence. Paul. Love casts out servile fear, retains with confidence at the same time reverence or fear. Therefore is added modesty, and the spirit of moderation and prudence, who makes us modest and prudent. The Holy Spirit awakens and increases filial love in the heart, and it also controls it prudently. On the other hand, love is stupid, unless it is guided by prudence. In other ways, too, great freedom is harmful, unless it is moderated by prudence. Matthew. We see that children are often abused with too much freedom. Paul. Therefore, God, in his wisest counsel, does not give a freer spirit without at the same time adding a more prudent spirit. And this signifies our court, which, as it is more spacious than the others, so it suits more sublimely. The one marks liberty, the other the prudence of the spirit. The higher the place, the better the perspective, the more accurately the surroundings can be seen and recognized. Whence our grown-ups, as if through mirrors can contemplate the whole state of the mind, can prudently control and contain the external and internal senses, and can easily foresee and prevent dangerous emotions. For they can not only prudently govern the mind, but also lead the whole body with a bridle. James? 3. 2. Matthew. But at least for themselves, they will not be able to provide for others. Paul? Yes, and others. They have the spirit not only of prudence, which is sound-minded and prudent, but also of modesty, which makes them prudent. The recruits are not yet able to consult for themselves, so they need guides. Those who are advanced can already consult for themselves in a certain way. Our elders can advise themselves and others. Matthew. Indeed, in the temple, but not outside the temple will they be able to give advice to others. Paul. Even outside the temple, provided they were received. 2 Corinthians. 8. 21? Let us provide goods, not only before God, in the temple, but also before men, outside the temple. They provide a face for these or procure goods, so as to cut off the snare of slander, in front of them, to supply a loop for going further. They prudently control all their things towards God, towards themselves, towards their neighbor. Matthew. But our wisdom displeases God. For it is he who wills to rule and control all things according to his will. Paul. We do not speak of the prudence of the flesh, but of the spirit of reason, not left to itself, but guided by the Holy Spirit, which does not reject the guidance of the Spirit, but follows it. 
and who can disapprove of what he has given, he himself does. The simplicity of children is acceptable to God and to men, the strength of youths, the wisdom of old men. Chapter 2. Of their state in splendor. Give major gratitude in faith, charity and hope. Matthew. We have seen in general how the mind is filled with the good things of the divine house, and how it is raised to a wonderful spirit of freedom and prudence, so that it can prudently control itself in its gifts before God and men. To the heads of those who sanctify, by faith, by charity, by hope. Colossians. 1. 4. 5. Paul. Here stood a great bronze altar for the use of sacrifices, thus there is greater faith in Christ. Matthew. Faith has its place partly in the understanding, partly in the will. It is in the understanding or recognition, in the will or trust. Paul? That's right. So here is the major recognition. I am writing to you, fathers, because you have known him from the beginning. 1 John? 2. 13. The fathers penetrate into the knowledge of Christ up to the beginning, when the word was with God, where all things were created by him, which recruits and youths cannot yet penetrate, or the fathers can know the sanctity and rectitude of the soul originally created in its integrity, which others cannot achieve with their minds, or if they wish, they form various and vain concepts for themselves. Matthew. But all tend to that rectitude who are in the temple. Paul. They tend to, but they don't understand properly until they get here. We have our imaginations about a certain city when we approach it. Others, when we first see the sight of the city and the tops of the towers. Others again when we came nearer, and the city is the same. Thus heaven is the same, but children, adolescents, and old people have different thoughts about heaven. Thus we all tend to the same divine image lost through the fall, but the nearer we come, the better we know it. Ours have a fuller recognition of Christ, they have a fuller recognition of themselves. Both recognitions grow together. They can recognize not only themselves, but also others, how far they have reached in sanctification. They can recognize in the word of God not only to believe, not only to do, but also mysteries. Matthew. But what is knowledge without control? Paul. Indeed, they can also prudently control this knowledge, so that it remains within the limits of the written word and modesty. They can restrain the intellect from curiosity, so that it does not want to think beyond what is written, so that it does not want to prejudice or prescribe to others. They are able to distinguish the necessary and useful, and rejecting the superfluous and frivolous, at least, dwell on them. In short, they can so control the recognition, that they always teach it, never harm it. Matthew. Enough about knowledge. You said that there is also a greater trust in the will here. Paul? So it is. Not only do they see the altar here, but they also offer and sacrifice themselves on it. Matthew. What is this? Paul? Out of love for Christ they deny their own will, and resign themselves entirely to the divine will, obedient to the future example of Christ, ready even to death to shed blood and lose their lives for Christ's sake. And they control this self-denial in such a way that they distrust themselves, not in some at least, but in everything, and trust only in Christ. Philippians? 4. 13. I can do all things in him who makes me mighty in Christ. Matthew. In this court more frequent sacrifices were made. Paul? There is also a more abundant charity here. Matthew. But what is the duty of charity? Paul? Charity is the queen of the virtues, it purifies, it orders, and when combined with prudence it controls the affections. Next, he urges and directs the exercise of good works with well-composed virtues or affections. Here power, love, and modesty are combined in the mind. Power or virtue is present, so that we can do good. Charity urges us to do it. Prudence directs, that we may do justly and in order. Matthew. Well, for everything in this court was arranged in a certain order, the sea of wine on the four-quarter oxen, the goats on the saddles, the columns on the right and left, in fact, everything stood in its place. All things were done in their own order. The people offered, the Levites prepared, the priests lit the sacrifices. Paul? The same may be said here. The recruits offer a willingness to help. 
Adolescents prepare their minds for good works. Adults do good works with a heart kindled by charity and moderated by prudence. Here they are exercised, there they are formed, and here the virtues of Christ are outlined. Matthew. Where do you prove this? Paul. Consider the example of Christ the Savior, whose virtues grew in childhood, were strengthened in youth, and were exercised in manhood. For we do not read that he himself published virtues or miracles, except in the thirtieth year of his age, after he had entered upon his ministry. Consider this, Ephesians. 2. 10. For we have been created in Christ Jesus in good works, for which God has prepared us, that we may walk in them. In the first court we are repaired, in the second we are prepared for good works, in the third we walk in good works. Therefore he cannot do good works well unless he has first been repaired and prepared for them in Christ. Hence it is also easily evident that we are not saved by good works, because we are prepared for them. Matthew. It helps me that Saviour Mark, 9. 49. All shall leap into the fire. Paul. Well for all good works, that they may be done well or in decent order, require the fire of charity and the salt of prudence. Matthew. I am glad to hear of hope. Paul. And she is also fuller here. Romans. 15. 13. For there are two pillars, one of which supports and the other directs hope. Matthew. He who stood on the left was called Boaz. Paul. This may denote the constancy with which the mind is sustained in hope. Matthew. Why so, when Boaz seems to be derived from contempt? Paul. Well, for a steadfast mind despises threats, through patience it despises the flattery of the world, by abstinence against both temptations he remains immovable in the hope of eternal life. Scorned. Others' strength, or strength in that which is not ill-suited to constancy. He must be strong who wants to be constant. Matthew. The columns had crowns on their tops. Paul. Consistency also reigns supreme. Be faithful under death and I will give you the crown of life. Revelation 2. 10. Matthew. The second column on the right was called Jachin, from directing. Will strengthen, prepare, direct strength in him. Paul. He notes the prudence that directs hope so that it does not err, falter, or completely fail. Hebrews. 10. 35, 36. Do not throw away your confidence, for it will have a great reward. For you need patience. To do the will of God, receive the gospel. Matthew. Pomegranates hung about the top of the columns, and when blown by the wind they made a sound beyond doubt. Paul. These indicate a watchful prudence, which is easily aroused by the wind of temptations blowing lightly, and attends to itself, lest it lose hope. Matthew. Why do you place the pillar of constancy on the left, prudence on the right? Paul. Because the left holds, the right directs the work. When constancy firmly holds the thing promised and hoped for, prudence, too, can direct hope itself well, so that it does not deviate or fail in regard to the hoped for promise. For unless the left hand holds fast, the right works in vain. Matthew. But what is this, Revelation? 3. 12. Whoever overcomes him I will make a pillar in the temple, others, the people, of my God, and he will not go out any more. Can it be accommodated here? Paul? Certainly. For he who constantly and prudently continues in sanctification, is finally founded in Christ, like a bronze pillar standing immovable, so that no storm can overthrow it, or move it from its place. Psalm. 15. 6. He who does this shall not be moved for ever. God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, will himself restore a little suffering, infants will strengthen, he will strengthen, adolescents, he will establish, seniors, 1 Peter. 5. 10. 14. To him be glory and power for ever and ever. Amen. Chapter 3. Of the Beatitude of the Hearts. Let them dwell in joy. Matthew. Psalm 84. 5. The blessed who live in your house will praise you forever and ever. So says Hierapsaltes, perhaps of these in our court. Paul. 
They are very happy. Matthew. Why? Paul? Because they praise God. Matthew. But those who praise rejoice. James? 5. 13. There is no one of good heart, he sings. Paul? And so ours rejoice in Christ. Matthew. Shall I give joy in this life? Paul? Joy of grace, there will be joy of glory. Matthew. But what is the place of the Gandhias here among the calamities? Paul? Very much. Can it be that, you have read Paul and Silas singing in prison? Acts 16. 25. Matthew. But perhaps others did not imitate this. Paul? Why not? Either, or not, advises St. Paul in 1 Thessalonians. 5. 16. Where do you go? And writing to the Philippians in Roman bonds, he urges this admonition very much, Philippians 2. 17, 18. I rejoice and rejoice together with you all. You also rejoice and rejoice with me, 3. 1. Moreover, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. Indeed, I do not hesitate to write the same to you, but it is safe for you. Philippians? 4. 4. Rejoice in the Lord always I say again, rejoice. And Saint Peter says in 1 Peter. 1. 8. That those who believe in Christ will rejoice in indescribable and glorious joy. Matthew. Where does this joy come from? Paul? From faith, and hope, Romans 12. 12. To the other spiritual goods that are truly present in the mind and are accomplished. Philippians 1. 25. I will survive together with you all to your progress and joy of faith. Where much proceeds, there follows joy. So they ascend to this joy. This joy also arises from a will that is calm and resigned to God. For the kingdom of God is not food and drink, but justice and peace, joy in the Holy Spirit. Romans 14. 17. Through the study of justice, the mind is resigned to God, because it wants to live not for itself, but for God, from which peace arises, the peace of Christ transcending the mind, or true peace of mind. From this point on, he ascends to joy. Matthew. Whether or not, do the inferiors also rejoice in the temple? Paul? They indeed rejoice and exult in the spirit, but sometimes at least. But ours are happy wherever they are. They sometimes suddenly seem to be raptured to joy, these dwell in God, just as the priests dwelt in this court in their chambers and could see the splendor of the temple perpetually, Psalm 25. 13, His soul will dwell in good things. Those who are outside the temple, passing through the gate, sometimes look at spiritual goods, but those who are in the temple live and dwell in those goods, especially those who are in the third court. Psalm 24. 3. Who shall ascend the mountain of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? With innocent hands and a pure heart. The others go up in the temple, these stand in the holy place, for they are more innocent than the others with hands and a pure heart. Sanctity, beginning and growing in the inmost parts of the soul, diffuses itself at last from the soul into the body, and the external members of the body, as hands whence, as the soul first, so the body afterwards also becomes the temple and workshop of the Holy Spirit, who uses the external members as weapons of justice. 1 Corinthians. 6. 20. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, that they are God's. Nay, they not only stand, but also live, as long as they live, in this holy place, whence David says, Psalm 27. 14. One thing I asked of the Lord, that I require to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To see the pleasure of the Lord. Matthew. Is this joy never interrupted? Paul? It is indeed sometimes broken off from the flesh, but it is easily restored. Philippians 2. 27, 28. God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also on me, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I have therefore sent him hastily, that you may rejoice when you see him again, and I am without sorrow. You see Paul's joy interrupted by sadness, but easily restored. Matthew. Therefore, nothing more is missing. Paul. Grace is present, glory is lacking. 
Our most gracious God does not want anything lacking in the good graces of the pious. Psalm 84. 13. The Lord will not deprive those who walk in innocence. Matthew. But in this way they have no need to grow any more, since you said before that the saints grow in grace until the blessed death, and then finally sanctification is fully consummated. Paul. Nay, they also grow in joy. John 16. 24. You will receive it, so that your joy may be full. Did you not read that Solomon built three porches around the temple, through which the priests ascended to enter the sanctuary, where everything shone with gold? And so ours ascend by degrees in joy, when they are called and exalted by the most merciful Saviour, to the kiss of the mouth, to the foretaste of glory. This is the ineffable and glorified vastness. Matthew. In this way you place the saints clearly in heaven, while they are still living on earth. Paul? Not at all. Do you not know that the temple itself was divided into a sanctuary outside the choir, into which the priests ascended to perform the crucifixion, and into the Holy of Holies in the chorus, where the Ark of the Covenant with the cherubim, covered with a great altar, which no one could enter, except the Supreme Pontiff once a year. Thus, although ours are sometimes admitted into the sanctuary for a foretaste of glory, they are not received into the Holy of Holies, into glory itself, where our Saviour already dwells in heaven. But our Saviour descends yonder to exhilarate the body, and assumes their souls as if made to meet him, Philippians. 3. 2. If how shall I meet the resurrection of the dead? Matthew. But at other times the priests always stayed in the court and in their cells, entering the sanctuary only rarely and in strict order. Paul. Thus ours, seldom admitted to the foretaste of the joy of glory, live contented with the joy of grace. Matthew. In the temple we read that the windows were narrow on the outside, wide on the inside, so that it was difficult to look in, but easy to look out from there. Paul? What else does this signify than that which the Holy Spirit says, the Spirit judges all things, but he himself is judged by no one? 1 Corinthians. 2. 15. For so long, then, all judgment would have to be checked, until we were brought here. For these alone judge correctly of spiritual matters, and of the state of the church. Matthew. How alone about the state of the church? Paul. Think that the whole face of the temple could be surveyed from all sides through the porticos around the sanctuary. Thus the saints brought here will be able to comprehend the length and breadth and depth and height, namely, of the spiritual building of the church, Ephesians 3. 18, 19. To recognize by knowledge the superior love of Christ, which others are not yet able to achieve. Blessed, then, are those who dwell in the house of the Lord. Blessed be the Lord for ever. Chapter 4. Of their defects and dangers. Not completely blameless before God. Matthew. Since they can readily do good, and easily suppress evil impulses, those who dwell in this court will perhaps commit no further offense. Paul. They have hands indeed ready and pure, but which easily contract and can be defiled by the source of sin in the blocked flesh. Therefore there was in this court very abundant water to wash away such fords. All the saints have to pray every day, forgive us our debts. Matthew. But let them be pure in heart, they must also be blameless. Paul. Yes, irreproachable, but, before men, not yet completely, before God, to what irreproachability, Colossians 1. 22. Is also to be tended, and indeed most of all. Let us be holy and blameless, our face in that love. Ephesians 1. 4. Strive, that you may be found spotless and blameless in peace, 2 Peter. 3. 14. It is a small thing to be blameless in the eyes of men, it is required that we also become blameless in the eyes of God, who, like the bright sun, sees the tiniest of defects and the smallest atoms of defects, to which the sincerity of God, 2 Corinthians. 1. 12. Much more is required than what we can achieve by doing or thinking. And it is not enough to be blameless in the recognition of the truth, it is necessary that we should also be found blameless in love and in peace. Matthew. You said before, to become a saint or a pillar in the temple of God, Revelation. 3. 12. And he will not go out any more. What is this? 
Do not those who live in this court come out of the temple? Paul? They go out, but to teach, not to fail. Matthew. Therefore they can no longer fail. Paul? With difficulty, recruits very easily, those who succeed easily, adults fail with difficulty. And if it happens, they fail, and become the most zealous persecutors and blasphemers. Hebrews 10. 29? Crucifying to themselves the Son of God and exposing the indignities and exasperating the Spirit with grace. Hebrews 6. 4, 5, It is impossible to renew them to repentance. Matthew. Are they not yet certain of their safety? Paul? From God's side always sure. For he is faithful. On their part, they are certain, as long as they watch. For they carry the treasure of salvation, as long as they live in the world, in earthen and fragile vessels, 2 Corinthians. 4.7. Matthew. They are still in the house of God, so they certainly hope for salvation. Paul. Let us keep the confidence and glory of hope firm to the end. Hebrews 3. 6. Matthew. So can they lose hope and hope. Paul. Think about it, if he withdraws himself, it will not please my soul. Hebrews 10. 38. The eye of prudence is burning. Matthew. Hence the danger of subduction. Paul. In the first place, that the eye of prudence can easily be swayed, and the foot of patience falter. Matthew. Whence this? Paul. Whether, or not, you have read about the wise virgins. Matthew 25. 5. Remembering the bridegroom they all fell asleep and slept. Therefore, every one of the most prudent can sleep, and completely fall asleep, unless they are roused. Hence they do not usually reject the advice of others. Next, there is a danger that the inner man sometimes gets sick, as is evident from Paul's infirmity. And just as the grotesque gradually recovers, so the inner man, recovering, has to ascend again by steps to his court. Now, if it happens that he himself will exist, what can be more dangerous? The inner man is sick. Matthew. Can they be sanctified from the fanciful? Paul. Why is this unusual? Whether or not, the priests of the Old Testament sanctified defiled, and were they on the way to sanctifying the temple again? First of all, consider what the prophet Ezekiel, Ezekiel 44. 25, 26, 27 had about the priests of our mystic temple. And they shall not go into a dead man, but at least to his father, to his mother, and to his son and daughter and to his brother and sister, who has not had one husband besides, and after he has been cleansed they shall be counted seven days. And on the day of his entrance into the inner gate to perform the rites in the sanctuary, he should offer for his sin, etc. Of course the priests were not allowed to pollute themselves with any other cares of the age from dead works, except the care of domestic needs. And when the mind is disturbed and polluted by the death of the father, mother, or relatives, or by other sudden cases, it must be gradually and gradually purified, and you shall count for him seven days between the cleansing. Returning through the inner gate to his court, he must first of all bring propitiation of the merits of Christ, and in him to ask for the remission of sins. Thus, of course, we were sometimes taken away from the state of sanctity, and our elders can return to it. From which it is easy to see that they cannot be secure as long as they live here. Matthew. But what should be feared by those who have found greater favor with God than the rest? Paul. The grace of God does not completely remove it, but it always shows us our weaknesses more clearly, and supplies us with the strength to correct them. As, therefore, the commanders of war are usually more anxious than the soldiers of the regiment, so here they are most afraid of those who see their weakness the most. Romans 11. 20. Do not think deeply, but be afraid. Chapter 5. Of their offices. They lean towards building by teaching. Matthew. What, then, must be done, that our hope may be sure and firm to the end? Paul we must watch over and devote ourselves diligently to the edification of the people. We must trade with the gifts entrusted to us, until the Lord comes to demand an account. Matthew. How do they engage in the building of the people? Paul. By teaching, by praying, by warding off the profane. If they do not do this, 
they will sin against God, against themselves, and against the church. 1 Samuel, 12. 23. These were formerly the principal duties of the priests in the temple. Matthew. What should be taught? Paul. First of all, the distinction between the profane and the holy, the pure and the impure, Ezekiel 44. 23. Precious and cheap, Jeremiah 15. 19, for that is why God first gives his light to some at least, because through them he wants to enlighten others. 2 Corinthians. 4. 4, 5, 6. Hence they are God's co-workers. 1 Corinthians. 3. 9. Matthew. But how will the rude take these sublime? Paul. Wherefore they must humble themselves and accommodate themselves to their captors. Whether or not you have observed, what is commanded of the priests of the mystic temple, Ezekiel 44. 19. And going out of the outer gate to the people, they put off their clothes, in which they performed the rites, and placed them in the vaults of the sanctuary, and they shall clothe themselves, and they shall clothe others. They are commanded to go down into the outer court to the people. What else is this, but to let himself down? They are ordered to take off their clothes and store them in the cells of the saints. What else is this, than to leave for the present the meditations on matters of higher investigation, which they use among the holy peers? They are ordered to put on other clothes. This is something else, how to adapt themselves to the captive people. Thus the best Saviour adapted himself, putting on a parabolic garment, to speak to the people, and spoke nothing without similes or parables. The same parabolic clothing must still be used, and the unknown spiritual things must be emphasized under the likes of the most well-known and well-worn ones, if we wish to grasp and understand them. For he who says that no one understands, although he himself understands, has not yet said. But he who says so, so that the hearer admits that he understands, must be thought to have said it after all. But the purity of this parabolic garment must be preserved supremely, and must be kept in the middle, lest, while we lower ourselves in the favor of the crude, we be defiled by mockers, and the sanctity and sublimity of spiritual things become a mockery. It is fitting to sympathize with the ignorant and erring, Hebrews 5. 2. Thus they should use these other clothes in teaching, but their usual clothes in praying. They lean towards building by praying. Matthew. Why, indeed, do they pretend to sanctify or inform the people with their robes? Paul? Because the people, frightened by the excessive brightness of holiness, could easily despair of the increase of holiness. And it is for the same reason that God did not deliver the ministry of the word to angels, but to men. For he who likes to run looks first of all at the forerunners, not those who are more distant, but those who are nearer, whom he trusts to be able to overtake by running. If he doesn't trust, he easily signs off, or completely changes course. Matthew. Why are they ordered to perform rituals in robes? Paul. Because we can never be too holy before men, especially those who are more easily rude, before God. Although before men the garment may be spotless and splendid, yet before God it is never without spot. Therefore we are never so holy, rather than holier than thou, and we can and ought to become more votive before God. Especially in prayer. God is a chaste mind, and he wants to be called chaste. They lean towards building by warding off the profane. Matthew. Perhaps this is the reason why some prefer to always perform the sacraments and pray in their robes rather than to go down to the people with them deposited, so that they may not be disturbed in their devotion. Paul? If they have been equipped with the power to teach, it will not please God at all if they do not want to trade in their talent. If they are destitute of those powers or of their audience, and moreover they are worn out in old age, it may be permitted to pass the little time that remains between prayers for the church, according to the example of Hannah, Luke 2. 37. Not abandoning the temple, but fasting and praying, he worshipped God day and night. Matthew. But you said that it was theirs, too, to ward off the profane, why is this? Paul. This is absolutely necessary, unless they wish to be trampled upon and torn to pieces, together with the temple, by the dogs and their own, to whom they gave the holy and through the pearls, which sad experience teaches. Matthew. Perhaps you refer here to what is written, 
Has the zeal of your house devoured me? Paul? Yes. For if there is any jealousy among the recruits, it is still carnal. He is still blind in his youth. But in our adults it is early. For it arises from a sincere hatred of vices. Temperate with charity and compassion for persons. It is guided by prudence, so that it becomes timely, mature and suitable for building. Therefore, all zeal, which is otherwise called divine or theological, should be restrained, until the prudence of the aged has arrived, which can discern vices and persons, observe the time, manner, and other circumstances, and direct everything to the improvement. Apples not yet ripe, though very noble, have an unpleasant taste, thus, nothing is more pleasing to God and the pious in the elders, than a prudent and mature zeal, just as in the juniors it is very displeasing to be premature, who the more violently he rushes, the more seriously he falls. Chapter 6. Can all the saints reach this far? Various exceptions. Matthew. Does God want to bring all the saints this far? I very much doubt about it, since it is known that only the priests of the Old Testament are in this court. Paul? But you must think that all the pious New Testaments let them be priests, and kings, Revelation 5. 10. Therefore, all must aim at this royal and priestly sanctity. Matthew. But where is the difference in the gift of goods and services? Paul? It is to be sought not so much in sanctifying gifts as in administering them, than adults. Apples are different and varied, but this variety is only clearly visible after they are ripe. Thus among the adults there are some who have been given the discretion of the spirits or who can show a variety of gifts, which is not given to all. Next, it must be observed that it is not so much the spirit or the gift as the external manifestation of the spirit that is varied. 1 Corinthians 12. 7. In all pious New Testaments, one and the same spirit dwells, but it manifests itself outwardly in a different way in this, in a different way in that. Therefore, the variety of gifts that are still growing cannot be accurately observed either by others or by ourselves, much less should it remove the desire and desire to excel. For how is it clear to you that he does not want to give more, to those who desire and ask for more? Matthew. But if they can be obtained on earth, as you said about adults, what is left in heaven? Paul? Far greater, far superior, which, even, the most holy ones overcome the capture of each one. For our soul will not yet receive all grace, let alone glory, here. Matthew. It is hardly credible that God can give greater power. Paul? Do you think that the immense sea of divine goodness can be drained by the narrowest vessel of your soul? The greatest part of what we take is the smallest part of what we cannot yet take. If you believe that God is immense, that he is infinite, that he is greater than your heart, why do you not believe that God can do and give more abundantly than we ask or understand? Ephesians 3. 20. Can it be that you believe that God would have manifested his goodness far greater if we had been able to grasp greater things in this weakness? It is left, then, to grasp all that he has revealed in his word, for we can scarcely get a shadow of what is to come, reserved in heaven. Attitudes of piety divergent. What he wanted to be hidden, they are not to be feared, which he revealed, are not to be neglected, lest we be found damnably ungrateful in them, unlawfully curious in them. Matthew. That is beyond dispute. But this at least is sought, whether all may attain to that sanctity which you have described in this court. The people indeed arrived here to be sacrificed, but did not dwell here, as the priests did. Paul? I require nothing here but an attitude of piety in distinguishing between good and evil, avoiding these, doing to others, if you grant this to all, not being content with the lightest disposition, as many are already content, easily more liberal to the diversity of attitudes. For it is still a quality of receiving more and less. Among the artisans we see some more ready and excellent than others, yet all trained in their art. Among the good trees there are some more fruitful than others, although they all bear ripe fruit. I will not let him go until I bring him into my mother's house, into my mother's room, said the pious soul of her saviour's spouse. Song of Solomon 3. 4. Mother Church has a house or a temple, which the pious enter with Christ, and has chambers or more secret cells, into which the pious retire with Christ, whom he admits as his most intimate friends.
Therefore such rooms in the house of the mother church must be left, if not for all, at least for some, and not completely removed or exterminated, as they do, who think that the sanctity of the inner court is completely impossible. Matthew. If it is possible, why does it happen not to many, but to a few? Paul. The fault lies not with God, but with them, because they do not want to tend to him. Matthew. But it is impossible that those who tend to it do so, because they perceive others to be ahead of others in holiness, which is contrary to humility, which commands us not to be wise in the high, but to associate with the lower. A wish. Paul. Thus think those who do not yet understand, how true humility also grows with the other gifts. What they think is arrogance and affectation in the saints, that is, a desire and desire to go further in sanctification, whereby they do not desire to advance others, but to advise themselves, lest they fail. To go forward is not to go back. What they think is humility in themselves is partly apathy, which does not want to aspire to higher things, partly pride, which they themselves already like in their gifts, partly envy, which cannot bear better ones. There are therefore others who are wise in their humility, while others associate themselves with inferiors in their desire and pursuit of holiness. Matthew. Nor is man better than man in the sight of God. All equally depraved in Adam, equally redeemed in Christ. Hence I wonder that you dare to build such different degrees of saints, when all who believe in Christ and strive to imitate him for the powers granted, in Christ may God be pleased as well. And those who here imagine what is better for themselves cannot escape the mark of singularity. Paul. The rebellious band of Kor once subjected to Moses and Aaron, Numbers 16. 3. Be content with yourselves, for this whole assembly, these are all saints and Jehovah is among them, why then do you emphasize Jehovah above the congregation? It is the same nature for all by which we are corrupted, the same grace by which we are restored to all, but who will deny that there are different degrees in this grace, since all expect the same glory, and yet no one lacks the degrees of glory. Saint Paul, writing with the other Christian apostles or saints in general, says, grace and peace, Saint Peter says, grace and peace will multiply. But to some in particular, as to Timothy and Titus, writing, adds mercy. Yes and Saint John to the elect lady, grace, mercy, and peace, by which I seem to insinuate that grace and peace are universal and common to all the saints. For all can and must reach peace or tranquility of mind through grace, and grow in these gifts. But mercy is special. For God, in His grace, would have mercy on some in a special way, granting a special office and special gifts, and he is not obliged to give an account of why he does not have so much mercy on all. For those whom he would have mercy on, he would have mercy on them out of the most free benevolence. Hence those who have obtained mercy do not think that they should therefore be better, that they should be more gracious and diligent before God. For to whom more is committed, from him more will be given. Who, then, will turn the honor of those who love Christ into the supreme pleasure of Evergeti above the rest. Matthew. But would it not be foolish arrogance to aspire to the holiness of the apostles? Paul. Apostles should be men suffering like us. That which God once gave to men, he himself will no longer give to men, from which it is clear. Extraordinary gifts, such as miracles, infallible authority, etc., necessary for the planting of the apostleship and the church, we leave to those alone and their successors. But if neither in ordinary sanctifiers, for salvation, nor in administrators for the office and government of the church is it necessary in our times to rise up to whose example, why did St. Paul says, be imitators of me, as I am of Christ. Matthew. If we strive for salvation by their example, we may imitate them. But if we want to become the church of light, without arrogance and singularity, we must not imitate them. Paul. Yes, that is what St. Paul requires from all Christians, Philippians 2. 15. That you may become irreproachable, sincere children of God without blame in the midst of a perverse and perverted nation among them, dry the lights in the world. Matthew. This was once among the ethnics. Where are the ethnic groups in the church? Paul. Look at common life and you will find ethnic people worse. I do not see why it is arrogant to want to be among these people the light of the world. Nay, they are arrogant and at the same time lazy, who do not tend to it, who see the light, and prefer to walk in the dark than in the light, 
or who prefer to hide among the ravens rather than trust in the eagles. Of the plates or columns of the church it is to be noted that it is not uncommon for them to see something of themselves, Galatians 2. 6. It is one thing to be before God, another to be seen before the world. There are many, and they are seen, many are seen, and they are not. God does not respect the authority of man. Matthew. I do not yet see how this can be done without arrogance. Paul. Who enters the military without hope of further promotion. Who of them, who desire to escape into the Chiliarchs or Dukes, arrogance calls. They are indeed called, but by those who prefer to remain in the state of laziness and sordid ignominy, rather than to aspire to higher things, others praise it. Who enters school and will always remain in the lowest seats. Who does not praise students who are successful and who always want to continue further, even if they are approached by dirty and solid accountants and lazy associates, no one who is not healthy praises their diligence. And in the school of the Holy Spirit, where there is the grace of God or learning, in the gymnasium of the Holy Spirit, where this rule applies 1 Timothy. 4. 7. Train yourself to piety. Is it not permissible to aspire to higher things without the arrogance and reputation of the Pharisaic swelling? Is it so that what is praised in human beings as generosity and diligence, is to be blamed in the sacred or singularity and arrogance? If this trite is valid in all studies, more, why not in the sacred, and foremost in the pursuit of holiness, without which no one will see the Lord? Of course, the earthly soul can never be sufficiently filled with pleasures, riches, honors, and knowledge. But in sanctity he easily fears the most wretched thing, do nothing too much. Indeed, what is the use of tending to those gifts, which in the world win not praise, but disgrace? Matthew. You insist so much on holiness. Don't you know what Luther taught here and there against the sanctity of his time? How often will he say, I am a sinner, how much more holy is he? Paul? Luther argued against external holiness, and called it hypocrisy alone without internal holiness, without recognition of original sin and living faith. For us it is now necessary to argue against the profane, both in sanctity, externally in character, and inwardly lacking in faith and charity. Vid. Luth. Tom. 6. Wit. PM 430. Saints are sinners, but to God, not to others. For not by sinning, but by repenting and living a holy life, they set an example to others. What else is more absurd than that you refuse to confess and correct your sins? Whence the modern profanity and loose license to live, except from this, that we demand from the common people a superficial confession of sins, but we do not insist on improvement, true sanctity and purity of heart. Matthew. I admit that sanctity is urgent, but how do you prove that the degrees of sanctity are urgent? Why do you make such a distinction, since all who are healthy in Christ please God? Paul? Who does not know that soldiers are promoted from the bottom to the top? No one suddenly becomes supreme. Who does not know the apprenticeship and progress of mechanics and artisans? The beginner does not immediately become a master, but he wants to become one, so he learns the art. Who does not know the classes distinguished in schools? And in the school of holiness will not the classes be divided? If, however, you are still in doubt about our three distinct degrees of sanctification, consider St. John distinguishing children, adolescents, fathers, St. Paul distinguishing bishops, deacons, all saints in Christ Jesus, Philippians 1. 1. St. Peter distinguishing 1. Peter 5. 1. 3. 5. Elders, juniors, clergy not only by reason of office and age, but also of sanctity. The elders of the church were once conspicuous above the rest, not so much by their age and authority of office, as by the sanctity of their typical life. They did not adorn the place itself, but the place itself. Therefore, it is not from the mind of the Holy Spirit in the Scriptures that we wash our temple of Solomon with its courts. For just as the state of grace of the New Testament can be outlined by this very thing, so the whole city of Jerusalem can be described in the same way and in addition the state of glory in eternal life from Ezekiel. Ezekiel 48. St. John outlined in his Apocalypse. Revelation 21 and 22. The temple, therefore, which formerly existed in the nature of things, he is already in grace, 
once he will be in glory. Previously he stood among those who are above the earth visible to the eyes of the body. It already stands in those who are in the heavens, visible to the eyes of the soul. For in these things God causes the soul to sit, quickened and awakened, with Christ. Your city is in heaven. Ephesians 2. 5, 6. Philippians 3. 20. Therefore the soul lives and converses with thoughts and desires in a spiritual place, next to the heavenly one. One day, he will stand in the heavens, no longer visible to the eyes of the body or the mind. As there in the temple of the nature of the pious Old Testament they saw outlined and expected the temple of grace, and afterwards of glory, 1 Peter. 1. 10. So already in the temple of grace we see outlined in the New Testament, and we await the temple of glory. There the prophecy and attentive expectation of grace, hear the glory, Romans 8. 19. 23. Philippians 1. 20. In the house of grace we await the house of glory, in the redemption of the soul the redemption of the body. Matthew. What is this to distinct degrees? Paul. Have you read, in my father's house are many mansions? John. 14. 2. 3. Of course the disciples could ask, where shall we stay when you leave? Jesus then answers, you will stay in my father's house, in the church, where there are many mansions. And if this were not so, I would console you with these words, namely, that he would go before me, and that he would prepare a residence for you. And I may also proceed, as if to say, from the house of grace to the house of glory, although I am about to prepare a residence for you, as if to say, in the house of glory, yet this shall be told you, that I shall return at the last day, and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you also may be. Matthew. What do you get from it? Paul. Because there are many rooms in the house of grace, the steps of the saints will be distinct, just as there were many cells in the temples. We must remain in these, but for a time and at least, until we learn what God proposes for you to learn. Then we must ascend to higher places, for as long as the Lord wills to lead us, until he wills to transfer us from this house of grace through a blessed death to the other house of glory. There really are mansions. Here are the constant climbs. Matthew. But if it happens that the saints die in the lowest cells, before they ascend to the highest, is not their salvation to be doubted? Paul? Not at all. They die happily when they die in the house of God, and they are of whom it is truly said, Wisdom 4. 13. He quickly became perfect. But they do not live happily, as long as they do not want to continue ascending, for we do not have a remaining life here, but we seek the future. Hebrews. 13. 14. He who does not always walk and seek as long as he lives here, will not reach the city of glory. Therefore, we must tend to it, so that we may live closely to Christ in the house of grace. Matthew. Who can do this? Paul. Who has always had and preserved the mind of the cure of the age? Matthew. Where will you find these? Paul. Once upon a time he was without wife and worldly cares. Saint Paul approved of their state, for convenience, for a decent and suitable adherence to the Lord without any abstraction. They were therefore able to sit, to dwell, to cling to Christ undividedly, because they were distracted by no cares of the ages. No, in times of war, they are exposed to the laughter and ridicule of all, who wish to be without a wife and cares, and to completely renounce all the cares and recreations of the age, and it is denied that anyone can cling to Christ with an undivided heart. But I do not see how it is really denied. For although not all take this word, yet it would not be denied of some. Although continence and castration are rare for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, yet, therefore, it is clearly non-existent. Has the Lord's hand been so shortened that he can no longer give this gift to anyone at all, or is he willing? But I do not assert these things, as if I required them from all, but to show him more strongly that it is not impossible that we insist on purity of heart, sanctity, and a habit of piety in our inner court. 1 Thessalonians. 5. 23. May the God of peace himself sanctify you all perfectly, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, so that you may be perfect and integrity lacking in nothing. James 1. 
4. Hebrews. 13. 21. He would encourage you in every good work to do his will, making you acceptable before him through Christ, to whom we glory forever and ever. Amen. Epilogue on the Temple of Solomon. Matthew. We saw the temple of the faithful soul. Let us also look for a moment at the temple of Ecclesias, once built by the apostles in the whole world, in which there are many dwellings of God in the Spirit. Ephesians 2. 22. Once splendidly built, now demolished or transferred to another place. What do you think about this temple? Paul? It is a mystery, it is an article of faith, about which no one can feel anything right, except in so far as it has been given to him to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Matthew. Whence the mystery? Paul? Compare what St. Paul wrote to the Ephesians about the gospel mystery, the church of Christ, and the gathering of the Jews and Gentiles. Ephesians 2. 22. 3. 3 to 4. 6. 18. 5. 32. It is believed not seen. Matthew. Whence the article of faith? Paul? Do you not say in the symbol, I believe in the Holy Spirit, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints. What we believe, we do not see. Matthew. Why do you insist on this? Paul? Against those who want a visible temple, and desire to point with their finger, this is, when, however, the kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor can it be said, Behold here, here, there, for it is within you. Luke 17. 20, 21. Matthew. But he who wishes to associate himself with the church must first know and see it. He is governed by the Holy Spirit. Paul? Believe and you will know. Ask for the Holy Spirit and faith, spiritual zeal, and you will see the church. For where the Holy Spirit is, there is the Holy and Catholic Church, because all the pious of all places and times have had and have the same spirit of faith and charity who works all things in all things, and governs the church. Learn therefore to know the church aright. Like a king, like a queen. The king is the Holy Spirit, therefore the kingdom or temple must be spiritual, spiritual things cannot be seen by the bodily eyes, or apprehended by the external senses. You see the churches in the world, but you cannot see whether they are holy, unless you yourself are truly sanctified by the Holy Spirit. The church is the communion of saints, the association of holy souls in the world, who are raised together by one faith to God, are dispersed in bodies throughout the world, and act in one and the same spirit. Thus the apostles describe this temple or spiritual building. Christ is the cornerstone. The prophets and apostles were closely superimposed on this. On the other hand, the faithful Jews of all times on the other hand, the Gentiles, who until now have truly believed in the crypt, have been built over these. Upon the faithful and holy saints of the first century, the saints of the second century were built upon those who were in the third and fourth centuries, and so consequently down to our times. They are built upon all these, which already remain in every place of the pious, until this temple of grace, having been completely built and completed in all its numbers, begins the temple of glory in another life. You see, then, that this whole spiritual edifice is supported by Christ, guided and completed by the Holy Spirit, who prepared all the pious of all times as living stones, gathered them, built them on top of Christ, combined them, and brought the temple to this point, and will bring the same further to the end. For he is the supreme architect, who indeed uses the work of the ministers, but he controls and directs everything according to his own discretion, not the ministers regarding the building of the temple. Not by human authority. He works all things in one and the same spirit, 1 Corinthians. 12. 11. The servants build on this side and on that side. But the Spirit breathes where he wills. Matthew. Why do you build this? Paul. Against those who think that the church should be ruled by authority and human wisdom, just like the police, since, however, human thoughts are often as distant from divine ones as heaven is from earth. Matthew. Therefore all human authority must be excluded from the church of God as harmful. Paul? Indeed, human authority is beneficial if it directs external rights, so that everything is done decently and according to order. 
Here order and external discipline give birth and increase in the mind the reverence of the divine majesty and of spiritual things. And since this order, and the external discipline that once existed, is now almost neglected, it is not surprising that profanity and impiety are increasing day by day. But as far as human authority is useful in external worship, it only harms the interior of faith and charity. Matthew. Where did you come from, Paul? Because it not infrequently suppresses the spirit, and deprives itself of all freedom, since faith cannot and ought not to be forced. Matthew. How does human authority compel, Paul? By imposing, and by condemning those who do not receive immediately. The Holy Spirit liberally educates the pious by His grace, and makes the children obedient to God. Human authority treats its disciples servilely, and makes them slaves of a foreign character. Matthew. How is this clear, Paul? Because he cannot bear even the smallest shadow of contradiction and disagreement, but whatever does not agree with his opinions, he immediately condemns. The Holy Spirit carries those who try to betray him, and instructs those who oppose him with meekness. The Holy Spirit wants only the sacred text, only the words of Scripture, but human authority wants its interpretations to be adored. Matthew. But the freedom of feeling must be granted to all, how will the purity of the doctrine be preserved? Paul? Indeed, it will be in the least danger, as long as the Holy Scripture remains, as long as there remain those who examine it with due diligence and humility and live holy lives. It will be difficult for them to be convinced of anything from the profane to the sacred. If human authority wants to be decently and usefully concerned with the preservation of pure doctrine, which is principally appropriate to the Holy Spirit, let it be a servant, not a lady of faith. He commends only the sacred text, and the efficacy of the divine word. He instructs beginning readers how to read the Holy Scriptures usefully, how readers and students of the divine word should live. He entrusts the rest to the supreme teacher, the Holy Spirit. For unless there is one within who teaches, he labors in vain to teach the language. But let human authority be careful not to make its readers more interested in themselves than in Christ. 2 Corinthians. 4. 5. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. Let him not desire his readers to admire his words rather than those of Christ himself. For in this way the human mind is very easily led away from the word of God by human inclinations and greed for novelty. Let him not think that without his works the Holy Spirit cannot govern the church. If he thinks this, he will be presumptuous in judging and condemning, reckless in defining, bold in prescribing what the Holy Spirit has not prescribed, and thus he will raise himself above the authority of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Scriptures, and will desire to compel faith and be dominated by consciences, which, how unjust it is, and what is wrong with the church, is in the forefather. Matthew. Thus can the Holy Spirit rule the church without human authority. His rebuilding, which had already begun, was hindered. Paul? Why not? Where is human authority when the church is in the wilderness? Matthew. What state do you think the temple of God is in now? Paul? I can't say that yet. The wisdom of the Holy Spirit is infinite, indescribable, incomprehensible, as our great Lord governs the church, and his power is great, and there is no number of his wisdom. Psalm 147. 5. However, as far as it has been given to me to understand, I agree with those who consider that we live in the times of the manifested Antichrist, and that the rebuilding of the temple devastated under the Babylonian captivity was indeed begun, but continued more negligently, as is clear from Esdras 3. 8. 4. 4. 5. 24. Where it is recorded that the foundation of the second temple was made with joy, but the building was hindered. As great was the rejoicing of the past century as the light of the gospel arose again, so great is the negligence now. Matthew. Where did these come from? Paul. Once upon a time there were men earnestly pressing the work in the house of the Lord. Esdras 3. 8. Are already, those who fear the power of the sons of the world and are easily hindered by faith. 4. 23, 24 for they are those who prevent in arm and strength. And these, when they fear the arm and strength, the work of the Lord's house in Jerusalem is interrupted. Matthew. 
What is the plan here, Paul? All the obstacles and hindrances are still hanging strong, each of us, to whom the light of the gospel came through the grace of God, let him begin in his place and time to press on and continue the work of the Lord in the building of the temple, as the prophets Haggai and Zechariah once warned, and thus the eye of the Lord will come upon the elders of the Jews, and no one will be able to check them. 5. 5. For God commanding is stronger than the world hindering. How it will be built? Matthew. How is the temple built? Paul. The stones are first prepared, then combined. They are prepared, through the recognition of the truth, they are combined through the exercise of charity. To prepare, because he builds badly, who wants to fit the square round. To combine, because although the stones have been prepared, as long as they lie apart, they do not advance the structure of the temple. With the stones, therefore, which we have previously spoken of as the temple of the faithful soul, having been prepared, the altar is a combination through charity, which is the combination of perfection Colossians, 3.14. For charity begins to animate the prepared stones, so that they become living stones, spontaneously offering themselves and fitting without any difficulty to the structure of the temple, whence we read that in the first building and construction of the temple, no hammer, no axe, no iron was heard of when the finished stones were brought, 1 Kings. 6. 7. Of course, what he sends out of charity, he sends freely and calmly. The most important and first work, therefore, was about the preparation of the stones. Preparation of stones. Matthew. What do you think should be noted about the preparation? Paul. First they are to be cut, then to be shaped. They are to be cut from the rock or rock of the world, for unless the mind is withdrawn from the wicked associations of the world, he listens to catechetic teaching in vain. It is sincere unless the vessel into which you pour it sours. Unless the mind has first vomited human wisdom, it cannot profitably imbibe divine wisdom. After the Israelites first came out of Egypt in the desert, they received a law which they had not been able to hear and understand in Egypt. Thus the mind immersed in the world, does not grasp the simplest part of the catechetic doctrine. The blind man of Bethsaida was first brought to the village by the Saviour, then he was healed and gradually regained his sight. Thus we see so much in spirituals as we die to this age. Matthew. This was already done in baptism, where, having been torn from the world, we said goodbye to Satan and his works, and joined ourselves to Christ. Paul. Well, but through careless education, through excessive license, the mother of all wickedness, through perverse associations, the mind has once again become attached to the world, to be torn away once more if it wishes to be properly formed by the teachings of heaven. Bad conversations destroy good manners. Unless they are avoided, the teacher labors in vain. Matthew. But which man can tear the mind of another from the world? Paul. We read of Christ that he was like a stone rolled down from a mountain without hands. Thus Christ's disciples were like stones not with the hand, i.e. they are withdrawn from the world by human force and coercion, but by the spontaneous spirit. In the meantime, the skillful and laborious hand of the stonemason is required, which the Holy Spirit directs as if it were his organ, and he makes a lucky blow, so that the stone is finally cut off. It is the Holy Spirit who removes and forms the stones. Let ministers be prepared at least to lend a helping hand, and not to ascribe success to their own wisdom, but to leave it to the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. Matthew. What should be noted about the stone formation? Paul. They are to be formed by careful study in public and in private. Matthew. Why isn't the formation that takes place in the public tombs sufficient? Paul. Because the forming tools are at least shown there, they are not applied, nor can they be applied sufficiently, because each stone is to be formed individually. Such a diligent formator was St. Paul. Acts. 20. 20. 31, who taught publicly and in public places, all in kind and each in particular. 1 Thessalonians. 2. 11, thus they are to be formed by public exhortations, and by familiar and private conversations. Matthew. Why private conversations? Suffice it to say publicly, he who wants to take it, let him take it. Paul. 
at least the devil corrupts most by perverse conversations, by pious and familiar conversations people are most educated, lest they be seduced by Satan. 2 Corinthians. 2. 10. Then they must be formed by careful study. A very slight lump in the square stones interferes with the combination and structure. Therefore, any small sins must be corrected. Matthew. But it is hateful to always correct everything. Paul. What then? We must commend ourselves, not to the ears of men, by speaking pleasantries, but to the consciences of men, by manifesting the truth. Moreover, they are to be formed with prudent study. Greater roughness, an ingrained habit, requires greater care in correcting, than minor roughness or slight faults. Those who do not observe this are often spreading the flea and swallowing the camel. Matthew. 23. 24. Finally, they are to be formed by tireless study. Matthew. Why so? Paul. The labor of breaking rocks, cutting stones, splitting saws, and preparing them for use is most troublesome. Many, being sorely offended, and wearied with trouble, impatiently continue their work, or leave it when they leave. No one will easily raise his hand to this work, unless he is compelled by human force, or attracted by the hope of gain. Thus it is a labor of no small difficulty to form the hearts of men with the stony teaching of catechetics. Some are so hard that they reject all formation. Some softer ones are indeed more easily formed, but they are also more easily damaged by the common enemy of health. But whatever it may be, whoever the divine will has chosen and called to this work, they must swallow all troubles, faithfully shape the stones entrusted to them, whenever they come, apply the norm of the divine word, according to it correct the unequal, correct and restore the defective to their former right state, rougher to smooth, to polish and decorate the polished, and thus to work incessantly. There are always deficiencies to be filled, there are always left to be corrected, no matter how many times they look at the stones. And if there is nothing left over, the dust must be wiped from the finished stones, and the other more imperfect ones must be continued. You will not finish the cities of Israel until the Lord comes. Matthew. Why are the stones to be formed in this way with diligent, accurate, prudent, tireless study? Paul. That they may be fit for building. Rough stones are useless. Whether, or not, did you read that when Solomon's temple was being built, the stones were brought in complete? Saint Paul alludes to this, saying, Colossians 1. 28. Admonishing all men and teaching all in all wisdom, that we all men stand still perfect stone in Jesus Christ. The stones are plainly not, or badly prepared, of no use to the Holy Spirit in the building of the temple. Matthew. But which man can so prepare the mind of another? Paul? We must do as much as we are allowed to dry. We must first learn how the Holy Spirit wants the stones to be prepared, and in order to know this the better, we ourselves must first be prepared, before we prepare others. Then, when we have learned this, we must work diligently and unceasingly in the stones or workshops of the Holy Spirit, there are stones to be visited, to correct those that fall into our eyes, with serious prayers to commend the stones to the Holy Spirit, who will persecute the rest, in our knowledge. For it is He who directs our forming hands, so that we may be His cooperators, who supports our labors, nay, who inwardly Himself forms and animates them, so that they may become living stones, patiently admitting culture, adapting themselves, spontaneously to combination. In the structure of the temple he knows how to replace each prepared stone in its proper place. We must think, therefore, that the Holy Spirit is the supreme master in the preparation of the stone, that we may accomplish at least that which is least, indeed that which is greatest, namely or as if to say, give growth. He who does not think of these things prepares badly, that is, according to his human will, not according to the will of the Holy Spirit. Hence we see that in these times there are many stones lying in the world, which seem to have been prepared, have a wild form, but lack the souls of faith and charity, they are dead stones, not living stones, therefore they cannot be combined in the temple, as far as it is visible, they seem indeed to fill their place, which they themselves occupied, but were not placed there by the Holy Spirit. But in the structure of the invisible and spiritual temple, there are none. For the stones of the living and the dead do not belong. And this temple, built of living stones, is like the wheels of Ezekiel, not bound to one place in the world, 
but easily transportable. For there is a living spirit present in the temple, which rests, rests, moves, moves the whole temple with all its living stones. Ezekiel 10. 17. And hence it is, when the children of this age do not want to bear it, that it can be easily transported into the wilderness, where it is not seen, and yet it is present in the world. To the governor and finisher of our temple, to the Holy Spirit, be praise and honor forever. Matthew. We have already spoken about the temple, what will it do? Paul. Perhaps it will be useful for testing whether we are inside or outside the temple, or if inside, for awakening, so that we continue in the pursuit of holiness. For he is not good who is not better every day. Or to demonstrate that the second article on redemption should be joined by the third article on sanctification, which today, if not excluded from our symbol, is nevertheless neglected in common life. Matthew. Who will it benefit? Paul? Not in the dirty shops, where there are those who are little concerned about Joseph's loss, laugh at the solicitude of others, and accuse them of arrogance, or of a new doctrine, or else of error or vice. Not in delicate palaces, where there are those who bear the arousal of conscience sorely, and what they themselves do not want to do, they consider it impossible, lest they be forced, to admit that others who do it are more careful and better. Not proud towers, to whom nothing but what they themselves do seems right. But for those who walk the humble way, love the catechetical doctrine, do not despise the advice of others, desire to learn more in the word of God and to progress day by day in true piety and holiness of heart. To supply them with even the smallest loop of further meditation on true piety and the building of the temple, is of the greatest value. Charity urges us to serve them, 1 Peter. 4. 10. Each one, in return for his received gift, serving the other as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If it does not profit others, it will certainly profit us, to which end we have spoken above all. God of all grace and mercy, who created us, redeems those who were created and corrupted by the devil's fraud, wants to sanctify the redeemed, to glorify the sanctified, to the Father, Son and Spirit, to the Holy One be praise, blessing, wisdom, power, majesty, honor, glory forever and ever. Amen. Finish.